For the public hearings, the board, as you probably know, reviews the correspondence that's been submitted, whether in support of or opposition to the individual cases. They also res, um, review correspondence from other government agencies and elected officials with regard to each case. Um, during today's hearing, staff presents the site plans, the maps, the photographs, and whatever else helps tell the story of the request that's being made to the board. Each of that comprises the case record. With the full presentation of the case record and at the conclusion of staff's presentation, the appellant will then have the opportunity to present his or her case to the board. After the appellant's presentation, any of those who wish to speak in support of the appeal will have a chance to do so. And then once those speakers have completed their presentations, uh, opposition, if there is any present, will have the opportunity to present their testimony. Upon completion of the opposition's testimony, the appellant will have a period of rebuttal that will conclude the presentation before the board closes and deliberates. Under our BZA rules, the appellant has 10 minutes to make the desired presentation in support of their appeal. In contested cases, the BZA rules allow for 15 minutes to each side for their presentations. Of important note, that's 15 total minutes. If there are, for example, 20 people who wish to speak in opposition or support of a certain project, it'll be important that you divvy up your time in advance accordingly as you only have 15 minutes for the full total of your presentation. Uh, if the appellant wishes to reserve some portion of time for a rebuttal, should reserve that out of the originally allotted 15 minutes. And we'll help with the timekeeping on that. At the conclusion of each hearing, the board will deliberate and then vote on the case before them. The board is vested with the power to act on these cases under the provisions of the Metro Zoning Code, specifically section 17-40.180. All the section numbers that we refer to come from the Metropolitan Zoning Code, which applies to the entire jurisdiction of the Metropolitan Government. The Zoning Code was adopted by the Metro Council and became effective on January the 1st of 98. I will introduce the entire Zoning Code and make it part of today's record. The Metro Code requires a record of these proceedings. And these uh, proceedings are actually broadcast on a YouTube channel as well as on Metro's cable access network. Therefore, it is imperative that anyone wishing to address the board, please come forward to do so. Take a seat at the table here at the front of the room and turn on the microphone. Please introduce yourself by name and your address and then make the desired presentation to the board. We're pleased to have you here and appreciate your participation in the public process, but we need to have it as part of the formal record. So thanks in advance for your cooperation on that. The Metro Code also requires four of our seven board members in order to establish quorum, with five at this particular hour or ready to proceed. The Code also requires at least four affirmative votes to grant an appeal. In the event that only four members are present and that appeal fails to get four votes, then the appeal will be re-advertised for the next available public hearing. In the event that five or more members are present and an appeal fails to receive four affirmative votes, then that case will remain on the board's agenda for the next 30 days. Applications that fail to receive four affirmative votes within 30 days of the public hearing shall be deemed denied by operation of law. Pursuant to board rules, an aggrieved party may um, appeal a board decision to the Chancery Court within 60 days of the hearing date. Additionally, an aggrieved party may file a motion for rehearing pursuant to all the particulars of the Metro Board of Zoning Appeals rules, also within 60 days of the original hearing date. After that time elapses, the board's decision becomes final and no further action can be taken. For the appellants, if your appeal is granted, you are required to obtain the permit for which you applied. You have two years to do so. A permit stays valid only for that two-year period. In the event that you wait more than two years to obtain the permit after the board hearing date, then the, valid, the um, approval is no longer valid and you'll be left to start at square one on your project. Should also be noted that if any false or misleading testimony is presented to the board, any board approval could be revoked at a later date by means of a show cause hearing before the Board of Zoning Appeals. Uh, Mr. Vice Chairman, I submit that all the cases have been filed in the proper order, all appellants have been notified by certified mail, and all legal notice requirements have been fulfilled. As one preliminary announcement, we will note that case number 2016-023, and that's for property located at 610 45th Avenue North, is being deferred to our next board meeting, the first meeting in February of 2016, at the request of the appellant. That is the only deferral, however, on today's docket. Uh, before going into our consent agenda, we'd like to utilize this opportunity to recognize any elected officials who are with us in the audience. And I know we have, I think, three at this point. Uh, ladies first, council member, would you wish to address the board with regard to your case? 
Thank you, board members. Um, I'm here on the matter of case number 20 at 95 Bellevue Road, um, uh, the Chabad uh, Jewish Center there, Rabbi Tektel. Um, uh, this uh, location is immediately to the south of District 34. So Councilman Rosenberg and I, I appreciate him uh, pulling me into the loop and um, having a community meeting um, as most of the notified community members were District 34 um, residents. I was in touch with um, the uh, leadership of the both the HOA boards across the street on uh, Bellevue Road um, to hear their concerns. I went to a community meeting um, and uh, all those concerns were allayed, and so there is no um, opposition in the community that I'm aware of, so I am in support of the project. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for allowing me to speak. I'd like to uh, join Council Lady Henderson in supporting the daycare for Chabad. Um, I know them to be a good, good neighbors of uh, high character and would ask for your consideration. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Councilman Davis, do you wish to be heard? Good afternoon, members of the board, um, staff members, Metro staff members. Thank you for volunteering and being a part of the board. Uh, thank you, fellow council members, for taking time out of your busy schedule to represent your great communities. I'm here in support of case number 2017025 off Cherokee Avenue. I rezoned this property and several other properties in this area. This was an industrial area going into a more residential feel, and because of the larger parcel, um, it was ideal ideal for density and affordable housing. So um, over the last four years, there have been several rezones in this area to multifamily and also to the RM20. Um, please support the applicant, and I'm in full support. Um, community has met about this um, a few times. They're fine with the density in this corridor of Cherokee. Um, Highland Heights Neighborhood Association is the organization that's over this area. Um, I spoke with some of the leaders today and they're in support. And please help them and grant their request for the application. And hopefully everyone stays dry today. Awesome, thank you, sir. I don't believe I see any other elected officials in the room at this time. If I'm missing you, please wave, because I don't want to be rude. Seeing none. Uh, Mr. Chairman, as you know, we utilize a consent agenda for each of our board meetings for members of the public. The process is such that one board member would review each of the cases on today's docket and identify any such cases where the applicants have met the criteria for the requested action from the board. If the reviewing board member then determines that the testimony would not alter the material facts of the case, then the case is recommended to the board for its approval. We will enter into the record those cases that have been so recommended, and if anyone is here in opposition to any of the specifically identified cases for the consent agenda, please raise your hand when I call that particular case so that we can remove it and hear the case in its regular order. We're pleased to do so. Uh, there are five such cases suggested for consent agenda today, Mr. Vice Chairman. First is case number 2017-009, Wiggs Thompson, the appellant, uh, for property at 509 Wedgwood Avenue seeking special exception from bulk regulations and a variance on landscape buffer. Originally, the project included a request for a variance on sidewalk requirements, but that request was withdrawn as the project will, in fact, meet sidewalk requirements. And I, I believe the council member that had expressed opposition now is in support also, right? That, that is correct, Mr. Vice Chairman. Thank you, and an important note there. Uh, the second case recommended for the consent agenda, case 2017-018, Bill Morton, the appellant, for property located at 3846 Cross Creek Road, seeking the variance from front setback requirements. Third, case number 2017-019, Arthur Ray, the appellant, for property at 521 Waycross Drive, requesting variances on rear setback and structure size restrictions for a detached garage. Next, case 2017-022, Jason Hitchcock, the appellant for property located at 2664 Barclay Drive. And then finally, case 2017-025, Frank Smith, the appellant for property located at 717 Cherokee Avenue, seeking a variance from landscape buffer requirements. Is there anyone here in opposition to case 2017-009, 2017-018, 2017-019, Twenty seventeen O two two or twenty seventeen O two five. Please raise your hand if so. 
Seeing none, that is the recommended consent agenda, Mr. Vice Chairman. Okay, we have a, a consent agenda. Do we have, uh, which we will uh, move into the meeting, and is there a second for the consent agenda? Second. Okay, any questions or concerns or comments? All in favor of the consent agenda, say aye. Aye. Any opposition? Consent agenda passes. For those appellants whose cases have just been approved on consent agenda, you're done. You have the approval that you seek. You are welcome to join us at the codes department tomorrow in order to pick up your permit. Don't go today. They won't know that you're approved yet. We're happy to help you tomorrow. If you wish to stay, you're certainly welcome. However, we'll then be prepared to proceed to the first case on public hearing. Members of the board, the first case presented today is 2016-127 for property located at 5056 Pine Valley Road. Shown here on the zoning map, this is an AR2A, agricultural with residential component, minimum two acre lot size property. Although the original parcel is dozens of acres, 60, 70, 80 acres, the portion that's in play is actually about 38 for this project. I've given a second zoning map just to give you some sense of the uh, location of the property uh, long terms of the county line that's Cheatham County in the gray area to the immediate west this is just north of Ashland City Highway before you go out of the county the request to the board is for a special exception for a camp use we don't see a lot of these cases but the Metro Code at 17.16.220 actually uh, gives the parameters whereby a camp use can be considered the parameters as you will see from the documents in front of you in your case files go to everything from setback, or rather uh, setbacks, landscape buffers, uh, access to the property, lot size, and the appellants will have the opportunity to demonstrate that they've met all of those today. As with all special exception cases, if the board is satisfied that they have met all of the conditions related to camp use as defined under 17, 16, 220, then that will be a basis by which to grant the appeal, or grant the uh, permission requested. Um, the aerial gives you a view of the thickly wooded property at this particular area, and the site plan submitted, although small on this particular screen, in your hard copies, members of the board will demonstrate some of the proposed uses and layout of the camp area there on the subject property. Uh, are there any members of the audience here in opposition to case number 127? There are. Therefore, the appellants will have 15 minutes to make their desired presentation. As a reminder, if you wish to save some of that time for rebuttal, you should do so out of this original 15 minutes. And after those wishing to speak in support have had their time to speak, then we will hear from the opponents next. Please feel free to make your presentation after you introduce yourself by name and address. Hello, my name is Brenda Smith. I live at 1501 Winding Way in Nashville, and this is my husband, Matt Smith. So um, one uh, change I'd like to, to make to our original application is that we were under contract for the 38 acres. We have since purchased the 38 acres as well as the 10 acres across the private road. So we have a 48 total. And that is reflected on the site plan that you just saw. The properties at 5056 and 5011 Pine Valley Road in the hills and hollows of Scottsboro. So let me start by saying that the um, Scottsboro community has done an excellent job protecting their um, natural features and from unwanted development. It has remained rural and natural, and this is why we're precisely why we're drawn to this um, area. We are adhering to the principles put forth in the Nashville Next Community Character Manual, which we've read thoroughly. Uh, we're in the T2 transect, and we have also, I believe we've adhered to the principles put forth in this book. Here, the Beeman Park to Bells Bend, a community conservation project. This book was um, uh, prepared for the Land Trust of Tennessee along with the community. And the, um, the important things that we feel like we, where we have uh, come in alignment with this vision are put forth in this book here, talking about uh, pres preservation of sensitive ecosystems, establishment of connecting corridors, protection and enhancement of the blueways, uh, preservation, uh, preservation expansion of working farms and locally grown produce, et cetera. Um, one other part in the book talks about some um, 
recreation opportunities that would be welcome in the area, and that included a rural conference or retreat center similar to the Monteagle Assembly in Monteagle, Tennessee. And whereas this uh, camp or retreat is not gonna be anywhere near that size, but we feel that the, it's got the same sort of feeling as that. Um, the, uh, bef um, our vision for this retreat is to be very rustic, a very low impact on the land, the, the, it's very hilly, as you can see in the, in the photos, and our buildings would tread very lightly on that just to pr preserve the, um, the ecosystems there, the wildlife corridor. We're very, we're very sustainably minded, and so we would be protecting the night sky. We would um, also use uh, best management practices and sustainability. I'm a, I have my lead credentials, so I take this very seriously. So another thing that we would like to um, pr promote at our camp is my goal is to have the camp 100% wheelchair accessible. Um, that's, we really believe that everyone should have the opportunity to enjoy the great outdoors and it should not be hindered you know, if you're in a wheelchair. The program for the camp um, is for 68 overnight visitors. It'll be 10 to 12 cabins, a couple of bunk houses, a community building, a pool, pool house. There will be in the community building an opportunity to have a, a bit of a larger group. Uh, if there was day use visitors coming alongside the ones that are spending the night, it would could increase up to 125 people on site at any time. But it never would be 125 and the 68 people. They would it would be part and parcel of that. This is not an event centric place. This is um, a retreat centric place. Then they may have events with within the retreat. Uh, church retreats, uh, family reunions, uh, things of sort, songwriters weekends, things like that. The architecture, um, we're envisioning it being very uh, rustic, modern um, architecture. We have some pictures here that uh, Matt can hand out. Um, Matt and I are both in the architecture profession, so we can guarantee you that we're not going to skimp on the aesthetics here, that this is, we're gonna put everything we got into this. When the, we first started with this, um, with this uh, plan, um, the first person I called was Anita McCaig at Community Planning and talked to her about the T2 Transact and National Next Plan. And then we talked with codes and the fire marshal, and then we applied for our special exception permit. And this was back uh, quite a few months ago. Uh, since then, we've had two community meetings that were very well attended. Uh, we've had a lot of feedback, um, and some of the things that we've agreed to in writing with the community that um, our maximum number of overnight guests was one. Um, and at, that, at the meetings, we did say, you know, on the 38 acres, we would never exceed this number. And at the time, I said, well, if we got more land, you know, who knows, we might grow. Well, we have got more land, but we will not grow. We're still going to cap it at 68. Um, there is a two-night minimum stay. Security is to be provided at all of... You said 68? Uh, the That's overnight guests. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's, yeah, if there was a wedding or something and they had some people who live in town, they could come out but not spend the night. Um, and if it was at a capacity, we would have a security on site. We will live on site. Our house might not be built right at the very first phase, but there will always be a manager on site, you know, 24 hours a day. Um, there's not gonna be any porta potties allowed after the construction period. This is, there's not gonna be RVs or b large buses. And the only campfires are gonna be allowed in the public managed areas, none at the cabins. And we've also talked with a fire marshal about this to further define these limitations. Um, any of the directions on promotional material will be off of the Ashland City Highway instead of the other end where it's more hilly. This is very direct, pretty straight shot down Bull Run Road. Uh, we're not gonna sell any alcohol. We will allow caterers to bring it or to BYOB. And it's not gonna be a farm animal centric place either. At our personal home, we may have chickens, but we're not going to be keeping livestock at this, um, at the retreat. As far as ATVs and things like that, we'll have one for maintenance for us, but the guests will get around with golf carts. And most of the logging roads that are on the site are gonna be turned into golf cart paths. So we're also not gonna have any amplified recorded music in the outdoor areas. 
the, the only music, there would be acoustic music with a very slight amplification just to project to just the few people, you know, past them so the singer doesn't have to project unnaturally. There is, the, of course, the 85 decibel limit at the property line, but we're, we are going to be well under that. We did a decibel test when we, um, I guess about two months ago, and we were producing the 85 decibels um, at the back site where any outdoor events would be, and I had the decibel meter on the ridge, and it was just barely perceptible there. And if you went over the ridge, and to the next hollow, you couldn't hear it at all. And also, when you come out of the hollow, the way it turns, as you can see in the site plan, there was no noise at all at the road. Um, also, we're just gonna ensure that there's not excessive noise on the property. This is a retreat. The intention for it is to be a quiet place. We're not gonna have, it's not a place for the wild parties. <clears throat> so we have done, um, a lot of due diligence technically. We've had surveys, we've had soil scientists, uh, septic mapping, hydrological surveys. We've had um, the, a parking management memo, wildlife biologists that spent a half a day with us out there pointing out the interesting features of the land. We've had a geotechnical survey and testing. We have our water capacity letter and we have a letter from the fire marshal agreeing with our concept of how we would handle fire protection. And though there are no hydrants on the road, we're gonna have a 30,000 gallon pool, which can be used as a hydrant, and which might be common in, in rural areas. Also, all the cabins um, will be considered single family and they will be sprinkled uh, using a reservoir because they will be outside of the 150 foot range from that. So we are um, certainly aware after all this due diligence of all of the challenges building on a special site like this, but we believe that the the reward is certainly worth it to have a retreat that is nestled into these woods and we believe it'll be an asset to the community. So we appreciate your consideration of our appeal. So I'd like to leave the rest of my time for later. Thank you. Yeah, I, do, I do have one question and, mm -hmm. and, and, I, and I appreciate the thoroughness of, of the materials that you've given. The, there's the planning uh, commission and I don't know or the planning department staff um, had recommended that we don't approve, and I don't know if you'd seen that recommendation. No, I and have not. it was primarily because they felt like there was additional information needed specifically to uh, the fire safety and health uh, issues in terms of the uh, accessibility, I think, predominantly, as, as I read it. Um, because they, they, their concern was that there's still a, enough of a mystery to know. What you would do to the, certain, you know, to the land uh, mm -hmm. to make it accessible, and and how that might or might not conflict with the rural maintenance policy that a, a good portion of your land is is under, and so I guess the, the question is what what have you done with the planning department to mm -hmm. discuss these issues uh, and help me understand what that's how that's happened, and then. Uh, That'll help me know if we need more discussion before mm -hmm. we're able to make a decision. Well, we had a, I had a preliminary uh, discussion with Melanie Hutchison, mm -hmm. and then my husband went and I think you emailed her a couple of times, and then went to visit her um, in person. And you know, we went over this plan, the one that you see here, and then she did send. There's a. Did you hand the packets? Yes. Yeah, the packets you have has a, a the text from her email in right. there. Um, that we would be allowed to, um, the part that's in orange would be a fire access road coming to the circle, and then the spurs that go off of that. Any of the buildings would be within 150 feet of all sides um, there, so they could reach that with the fire hose. And then the, the long road that goes down the um, valley would be accessible by a truck. And, and she said that it was more of a pickup truck um, at that point and the anything on the hills were going to just be handled with the um, sprinkler system and they're just one room cabin so that's very they're very simple it's just basically like a hotel room you know and then there's there's a, a you know microwave and a, a refrigerator and then a bathroom right. so there's not there's no open cooking no open fires there and they thought that was acceptable yeah I, I mean I guess but that was you said that was with the fire 
folks, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think that this is really more the planning department saying, I mean, I, I'll just, in, you may have seen it, you may not, but just not. as a quick paragraph, I'll say, um, you know, there's, uh, let's see, there's a conservation policy covering a majority of the property. This camp as a use may be appropriate for a rural maintenance policy. However, there is insufficient information to make that determination and staff is concerned that the life safety improvements uh, that may need to be made would make this inconsistent with rural maintenance and conservation policy. In summary, the plan as proposed may not be achievable given the existing infrastructure and without more information, the staff recommends disapproval. So it, it sounds like that the planning staff would like more information. Okay. Um, so it's related to ADA accessibility? I th that? That's the way I read it was that, that uh, because it, it, it under the staff concerns, it says fire safety and health may require mass grading of the hillside to meet safety concerns, mm -hmm. which is not consistent with the policy. Mr. Vice Sorry. Chairman, if I may, on behalf of staff, mm -hmm. having spoken briefly with planning about that recommendation, the fire safety component did have a lot to do with the mass grading question mark. It does not sound from the presentation that mass grading will be no, required in order to meet the fire marshal's preferences in terms of the fire safety components. Mm -hmm. And that is a question mark for planning because under the existing policy at this location, mass grading is a big no-no for mm -hmm. them at this because sure. you're trying to conserve as much as possible and understandably so in this part of the county. That was one of the key bases for that component of the recommendation from planning. So mm -hmm. perhaps if the appellants probably have more information about their discussions with the fire marshal with regard to whether or not mass grading would in fact be required to achieve the objectives identified by the marshal. Uh, we were not planning on doing any mass grading with our uh, discussion with, with the fire department. On, it was determined that none would be required uh, because the fire trucks will not need to gain access to the upper ridge, to the upper road. Um, the uh, sprinkler system being sufficient for that. She did want to have a uh, uh, pickup truck be able to access that road. Um, and it's an existing logging road. And the only modifications to that road that would need to be made are indicated with the, uh, the green lines on the plan, uh, uh, which are switchbacks at the steepest parts which are currently at approximately 50% grade. Uh, that, those interventions are uh, not what I would consider to be a, a, a major intervention. And then regarding accessibility to the units, we will be utilizing, um, <coughs> excuse me, um, <coughs> sorry, golf yeah. carts, uh, accessible golf, mm -hmm. golf carts for patrons to be able to access the cabins. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the buildings uh, of more public nature, the, the gathering room, the pool house and whatnot are on the lower, uh, flatter parts of the site that are near the road. Okay. And they're all within the 150 feet. But the, the egress from the cabins will be by way of a, you know, a boardwalk that comes out and goes along with the grade out to an area of refuge out there. Does anybody have any, any questions? of the applicant. Okay, you all have six minutes and 24 seconds to rebut anything that the folks okay. in opposition may have to say, okay. and they will come up next. Okay, so do we go sit? Yeah, you yeah. can just okay. take a seat and uh, and allow the opposition to come forward, and then uh, you'll have, a, have six minutes and 24 seconds to uh, talk afterwards. So if you could state your name uh, sure. for the record and tell us what you're here to say. Yeah, I'm Joe Engel. I live at 5711 Old Hickory Boulevard in Scottsboro. And uh, <clears throat> we are really appreciative of the Smiths and the meetings we had with them in the community. I would say this is one of the people who helped author this document to preserve our community. One of our real concerns is that we keep it country. You may remember our light green t-shirts against Maytown Center emblazoned with Keep It Country when we had that fight. That's what we're trying to do here. And I appreciate you raising the planning department's concerns, their concerns, we have too. And with all due respect to the lawyer, I'd really like to see those addressed in writing so that we have a definite opinion from the planning department about what this proposal is going to impact in terms of the environment. Uh, my main concern beyond that is this. Uh, I think there'll be great neighbors 
but we're concerned what happens if the property passes on from them. So we want to be sure whatever we agree to here is nailed down so that the future of our community is protected. And we're concerned, and I'm still concerned after hearing the testimony, about amplification of sound. One of the reasons we live where we are is to keep it country, to keep it quiet. Uh, we make sacrifices to do that. We deal with our own sewage. We have septic. We deal with our own trash. We hire private contractors. We're happy to do these things so that we can keep it quiet in country. That's what we want. And you start amplifying sound. We've just had a very unpleasant experience not too far away with Fontenelle. Sound really carries. And I'm also a United Church of Christ minister. I've done plenty of outdoor weddings. You don't really need a, a microphone or anything for an outdoor wedding. You can pull that off just projecting. Uh, so as far as I'm concerned, I think a, a number of people feel this way. We're a whole lot more comfortable with the discussions we had at the community center with the Smiths. We're talking about playing acoustic guitars and talking around a campfire. We're not really comfortable with sound amplification in the country because that can take you down a road that no telling where you're going to end up. Uh, again, I want to thank the Smiths for meeting with us and discussing things with us. Uh, but I would, in summary, really would like to see what the planning staff has to say in writing in detail to those concerns they have that we also share. And also this whole question of music amplification. Now, I was a camp counselor for, in a camp outside of Richmond, Virginia for four years. We had no amplification in that camp. That was the whole point. You bring the kids, you bring the people out, so it's country. You don't want to be projecting sound out into a rural environment. So just want to lay that out there for your concern. I appreciate your time. And again, thanks the Smiths for meeting with us and discussing this with so, us. So you're, you object more to the lack of details to date than the concept of a camp on the property. I have the, some of the same concerns that the planning staff has about how the camp's going to function and how all this grading or not grading, et cetera, is going to be resolved. I think we need to have that hashed out. Having said that, once those environmental issues are met and we have it in writing and say, yeah, this is okay, right. then we can move on and talk about the whole sound question and what's going to happen with that. So again, in principle, we're not opposed to this. We okay. have specific concerns that we want to be sure are addressed before the camp goes forward. Okay, and, and that, that's really helpful because, you know, sometimes people come and they absolutely don't want what someone's trying to do. No. And sometimes people come and they say, well, it's, you know, we're not opposed to it, but we really want it to go a couple, a little bit longer and flesh it out a little bit longer before we can, you know, can agree. And that, that seems often fair enough, too. Exactly. So. And okay. again, we're grateful for the Smiths and meeting with us. We just have these two remaining areas that we're really concerned about. Okay. Thank right. you. Yeah, are there any questions for this gentleman? All right. Thank you so thank much. You. Is there anybody else in opposition that would like to speak? So if you could just state your name and tell us what you have to My say. name is Mac Wilson. I live at 4898 Bull Run Road uh, in Scottsboro. And I share Mr. Engel's concerns. And I think that mostly uh, the general consensus in the community is that we support a camp of this nature. Mostly we're concerned, I, as I say, I share Mr. Engel's concerns, but very much I share the concerns of amplified music. Um, I've recently, in the last several months, had to address amplified music concerns at Fontenelle. Now, I understand that this is a camp and Fontenelle is a major, is a major venue, but 85 dB coming off their property at Fontenelle has echoed into uh, the hollers upwards to two miles away. So my concern is that, is that, that, that we can't hear that the music is, is, it is performed in such a way that it can't be heard off the property. So thank you very much. Awesome. Thank Appreciate you. So, you. Anybody have any questions? All right. Thank you. All right. Is there anyone else that would like to speak in opposition of this case? If not, we'll have the applicant uh, come back.
And Mr. Vice Chairman, once the rebuttal period is completed, the district council member has made it in for the meeting, Councilman Leonardo, and he wishes to be recognized after the completion of the rebuttal comments from the appellants. Okay. We are in full agreement with the uh, acoustic levels and uh, wish to uh, assure people uh, whatever means is necessary that we would establish uh, strict requirements regarding that. Mm -hmm. A lot of our people that would be staying here would be people that are seeking the quietness of the, of the countryside, and we would not want to compromise that in any way. Uh, when we talked about gentle amplification, it would be, let's say, a person with a guitar with a circle of people at about our distance. Um, sometimes uh, acoustic performance performers uh, like to have a gentle amplification just to reach their audience. But we would uh, be in agreement that no noise would um, leave the mm -hmm. leave the property lines. Yes, when we did the uh, decibel test, uh, ambient forest noise was about 35 decibels, and Matt was uh, creating 85 decibels at the area. What we think that the outdoor any outdoor music would happen, and I could only pick up a penny whistle. Um, the other instruments I couldn't pick up on the ridges, and it was at 40 to 45 decibels, so it was just barely above that. Um, and then as I went out the property, he was at the very, very back, um, and then I went out to where the orange circle is, and it was about 40, 45, and went out to the street, it was just ambient forest noise. I couldn't hear anything. But we would be more than happy to do additional tests and, and um, to make sure that whatever you know, we're allowed to do works. Yeah, and you know, one of the things that, that we've dealt with, especially when there's special exceptions, either mm -hmm. for this type of, of use, uh, it's the first camp that I've heard, but mm -hmm. there may be others that have come before this board. Um, we've had historic home events, we've had other mm -hmm. special exceptions for um, assembly space and event type space, and and they're very specific uh, to the locale, to the you know the, the concerns of, of specific uh, the, the neighborhoods uh, neighbors of the specific areas, and often it uh, it comes with you know, just kind of that list of things. You you have certainly done a, a good job of starting a list, and I think the fact that you had neighbors uh, that come with concerns uh, about specifics but not concept is, is is certainly to your credit uh, for the homework that you've done. Um, but it does seem like that with the the planning department. Uh, to me, and I, I can't speak for my fellow commissioners, but with the planning department recommendations wanting a little bit more information and your neighbors, that it it, it would be something that um, would be right to defer for some period of time to say, hey, let you know, because you've, it, it sounds like you've done a lot of homework, mm -hmm. especially with the fire uh, uh, marshal's office, that that might uh, address some of the planning de uh, commission or planning department's concerns, mm -hmm. and I think that with some additional discussion with your neighbors uh, and maybe with the help of the codes folks to say, well, what have other folks done? You know, right. how, how have they, you know, we've, we've had some that are in downtown that have said, well, no, no amplification in the backyard, but you can have a wedding on the porch in a, a mm -hmm. certain amount of, you know, certain periods of time during the day. Um, but just, just to kind of flesh out some of those things that, that really give uh, your neighbors ease since, one of the criteria for the special exception is kind of the impact in the area in the neighborhood. Certainly. So I think that the neighbors' concerns are important in special exceptions. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, and and I do applaud you for addressing uh, so many of those ahead of time um, and, and for the homework that you've done. But that, that just, that's how I'm, I'm seeing it. And I don't know if, ever, if anybody has any other questions or if they are comments about that too. But. Well, I have a question. I you've given us a lot of information, great presentation. I just don't recall, were you planning on having weddings at this camp? We keep talking about it. But. Yeah, <laughs> everybody assumes everything is wedding oriented mm -hmm. because it's such a big business. Um, we would al allow, I mean, we wouldn't turn down weddings. That's not our focus mm -hmm. uh, to do that. Um, it would, I mean, it's... We would not want the wedding with the big DJ and the dance floor and the loud music. Um, if someone wanted a mellow wedding, That'd be that would be more appropriate we for would this. Draw we, and mm -hmm. we would say, well, we have a decibel limit, and so you can't have your DJ, or or whatever. So we would, we would mm -hmm. pre-qualify. And we would people. be living there. I mean, we don't want to. So we'd be the know. closest neighbor, <laughs> yeah. and we covet quiet. Okay. So I, we'd be the first to complain. I have a comment. I was um, interested in what the pastor said about future owners. You know, 50 mm -hmm. years from now, what's going to be happening there? 
and I would like you to pay attention to that. Certainly. If you do make more plans or okay. make some, you know. And I do know how difficult it is, and many of the lawyers here will tell you to put any kind of um, um, things on property transfers, but mm -hmm. that needs to be addressed. Okay. Because I appreciate the neighbor's concern there. I grew up on the farm, and I like peace and quiet Certainly. as well, so I appreciated that comment. Okay. And with the, with the uh, limit, of, with the size of the valley, we would not want to grow the camp further than uh, what we're proposing. Well, I don't it, think, we couldn't with septic limitations anyway. So. If we were to buy 10 more acres, we wouldn't want to put more people out there because we, we want to keep an appropriate scale. If, um, if we were to defer this case to give you time to, to work out that list, and I do think, I mean, Alma's point is, is 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 right on target in the sense that once you grant a special exception, it does allow whoever owns it after you. And I, I hope it's a, the type of wonderful camp that would, you know, uh, be a camp uh, after you know, hopefully 20 or 30 years that you all might run it and uh, and, and retire or whatnot. That that it would continue. But I think those are the kind of things that are really important and that probably do need a little bit more detail. So if if this were to be deferred and it certainly hasn't been discussed. Uh, it's, it's something that, that I'm considering because I think there needs to be more information for me to, to support it, although my general inclination is let's get those details done to figure out how to make this happen. Um, is, is, a, is a month, two, uh, you know, we meet again, uh, I believe, in maybe two and a half, three weeks, um, but we meet on the first and the, and the third Thursday, uh, and given the codes department and, uh, and how busy everybody is, it seems like two, two meetings might be more appropriate than one. I but it can be three, it can be whatever you feel like you need to do to... I think a, a month feels like it would be okay, because okay. we would like to do some sound testing, you know, with an uh, outside consultant. And there. maybe even with your neighbors, too. Yeah, meet with the neighbor, of course, yeah. And, 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 and we, that was a public invitation when we did the first sound test. We invited folks out. Um, nobody was able to make it to that one. Okay. Um, we would want to get some more clarification regarding uh, the grading. Um, just to clarify, we're, all of the buildings will be on piers and with minimal site uh, intervention. We want to do as, as little uh, disturbance of the soil as possible. And any accessibility to the structures would be with ramps and, uh, as I mentioned, with the golf carts. Mm -hmm. And I think those are the types of things that if those were uh, outlined in and, and some type of agreement or, or list okay. that that Alma was referring to that that would be part of the condition of the special mm -hmm. exception that would also protect it down the road too when uh, it would it would give those um, those construction guidelines so I think that would be Certainly. really really helpful well it'll give us time with a civil engineer to have the the grading plan for the switchbacks so that we'll know exactly what we're talking about as far as the, okay how that's going to be constructed does anybody have more questions? Yeah, I guess, um, you know, I'm not a musician and, you know, I don't know much about amplification, but when I read the, um, what I, and this might be an old version of the zoning code, so the zoning um, department will have to verify this, but um, under the special exception for camps, it does address outdoor loudspeakers, mm -hmm. and um, it sh says there shall be no outdoor loudspeakers or public address systems except as may be needed for emergency purposes. Okay. So if you were to defer today and come back to us with more information, can you address that okay. um, specifically? And the codes department can verify if this is the right. Um, okay. The zoning code is updated often. I might have an old version, but but if you could specifically address that when you okay. come back. I will too. Are there any other any other questions for that point? Did you have anything else that you'd like to say at this point? No, sir. Uh, uh, no, there were, uh, I think, a couple people with uh, comments to say in support of it, and I didn't know if there was time for that or, or not at this time. Um, well, we normally, um, if you, for in the, the rebuttal period, if mm -hmm. you, uh, they needed to speak in the front okay. part of the hearing so that if the opposition had anything to counter. So if you if you don't speak first, you can't speak okay. second. But we're happy to have a show of hands of the folks that have come out to, to support this project if you'd like to raise your hand. Great. Right, thank you. And then I know that the council person for the district wanted to, to speak, and so this probably is the best time for you to come and 
Ms. Pete, thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you guys, and I, and I apologize for uh, being tardy. I was in Fourth Circuit Court and uh, long hearing, and I couldn't just very well get up, but I did let Mr. Herbert know. Uh, I will say that uh, we like the Smiths. We think that they're, they're, good, they're good people, and they're trying to do a good thing. Uh, we've had three community meetings uh, where we were trying to come up uh, with conditions, and we've really kind of agreed on just about all the conditions, except there's a couple of concerns uh, that you heard from uh, Mr. Wilson uh, and also uh, Mr. Engel uh, about uh, the, the noise, as well as uh, it was our understanding there was going to be someone on the property at all times. Uh, and I know that the Smiths intend to move there once they uh, maybe retire and back off uh, from what they're doing presently. But um, I would ask uh, this honorable commission to uh, to defer this, to allow us to make sure that we get all the conditions right, because we are really playing very well, okay? Um, and, and I think we can do that. And I also wanna make sure that, uh, that the Smiths have an opportunity uh, to uh, satisfy planning, okay? And whatever the recommendations that they may have, because overall the community does support it. And I will say that it's, as you said, it's not, we don't see a lot of these. And given District 1's rural nature, uh, this will be something after the Smiths get done that I will definitely be taking a look at and examining to determine if there needs to be some changes made uh, to that special exception because it, it, but the Smiths aren't the kind that are going to abuse it, but uh, I would like to give them an opportunity uh, and to make sure we get our conditions together and I can submit that to Mr. Herbert prior to the next meeting and they can do what they need to do at planning uh, and, and, move the, and try to move this forward uh, for them. So uh, I appreciate your time and appreciate you allowing me to speak Great. Well, thank you for all your work to uh, to work with the both all the interested parties in this in this project. Uh, does is one month is that acceptable to you? Do you think that's enough time for? Yes, sir. I believe that's enough time. Okay. I know they'll get on it, and uh, I'll get on it with them, and along with Mr. Engel and Mr. Okay. Wilson. So we'll make sure that we get those conditions finalized uh, okay. and submitted to Mr. Herbert. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Okay. With that, I'll close the public hearing, and it sounds like. Uh, everyone's in agreement that we should defer this a month. Is that in agreement with this body? I agree. I'm, I'll move that we defer it for one month. I have a motion. Is there a second? Second. Uh, there's a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Uh, uh, no, any opposition? Okay, this case will be deferred until the second meeting of February. And that's going to be February 16th, 1 o'clock at the same location, Mr. Vice Chairman. Uh, we're ready to move on to the second case of the day after that deferral, case 2016-158. This involves property located at 1806 Hyman Street, Council District Number 21, EDH Properties Group, LLC, is the appellant and owner of this property. They're requesting... Um, I, we've got them kind of in reverse order. There is a request for a variance from a side setback, but the first portion of the case involves an item A appeal on a property that was once a legally non-conforming duplex in what is now an RS5 zoning district. The request is, for the project is to build a new duplex at this location. Uh, so the first item taken up by the board will be the question of the item A appeal, whether or not there was an error by a zoning staff and zoning administrator in determining that the legally non-conforming status had in fact been lost. Uh, and then if, in fact, the board determines that that was an error and that the item A should be granted to the appellant, then you can, should take up the question of the proposed variance from side setback requirements at this location. The zoning, the zoning map shows you the strip of uh, Hyman Street here and highlighted at 1806 where the subject property is located, all of that block face being RS5 zoning. The current condition of the property shown here on the aerial map as it is sitting just a couple of blocks off the main intersection. Street views from the site visit back uh, in the fall, actually, shows the view of the subject property in the upper left-hand corner, uh, the view directly across the street in the lower right-hand corner, and then the views up and down Hyman Street here in the two pictures in this slide. Is there any opposition present to case number 158? There is. Therefore, the appellants will have 15 minutes to make the desired presentation. Ms. Capehart, representing on behalf of the appellants, um, you'll want to leave whatever time you wish for your rebuttal, of course. And after the presentation by the appellants, we'll hear from the opponents. Okay. Ms. Capehart, if you would introduce yourself by name and address. Thank you. My name is Tiffany Capehart. Uh, my home address is 2940 Baby Ruth Lane, Unit 5, Antioch, Tennessee. And I do have the property owner here with me. And so he'll speak when he's needed to speak. So it, if you could address the item A part of the appeal, that, I think you said that, John, right? The, if the, the item A um, part of the appeal, which is that it lost its legally non-conforming status. Yes. Uh, because if, if that, that, that one is, if we decide on that one 
in a certain way, then the setback okay. uh, is not a question that we would take up. So that, that's the one that we need to talk about first. Yes, and I just wanted to say too, we were re we are requesting to actually draw the setback request variance because when we were meeting with the neighbors, there was um, a con concern about, about a smaller setback. So we've decided to, to go ahead and withdraw that. Okay. Um, so we're gonna just address the um, item D, um, the item A, I'm sorry, appeal, the non-conforming use and structure at 1806 Hyman Street. Um, so the existing structure um, that's there today, the land use is a two-family duplex. Um, in 1998, the zoning was changed to RS5, which is single family, 5,000 square foot lot minimum. Um, the duplex existed prior to that date with property tax records dating back to 1936. Um, the duplex has been vacant for longer than that 30-month um period and therefore has lost its legally non-conforming land use rights. So the, the question I have mm -hmm. for, for you is when the zoning administrator says that it's lost its legally non-conforming use and you just made a statement that said it had been vac it had not been used as a duplex for 30 months and therefore it lost its, its use, I'm not sure what the basis of your appeal is on the item A to say that the zoning administrator erred or uh, made some other kind of error in that determination. So what I have here is item D, appeal nonconforming uses and structures. So the when we went to pull permits to be able to either tear this down and rebuild two units, they were saying that, well, this structure has been vacant for longer than 30 months, and so you Sure. You've lost your ability to build two units. Well, let's ask John Michael for some clarification here. Item A versus item D and what's Sure, really item D is typically, we refer to it out of 17.40.650 where we look at legally non-conforming uses. So an appeal with regard to a change in a legally non-conforming use or an alteration of a legally non-conforming use here, duplex use and single family zoning, would be governed as an item D case, as we call it. And it just has to do with the alteration of either the structure or the use itself that's presently not conforming to the base zoning code. Um, the item A component of this is important. If the legally non-conforming use continues without interruption, with no breaks in such use for a period of 30 months or more, thus meaning maybe you've changed tenants in your duplex, uh, maybe even had six months, one year, one and a half years of absence on part B of your duplex, but you've never gone more than 30 months interrupting that continuous duplex use, then you maintain your legally non-conforming status. Uh, we kind of carelessly overuse the term grandfathering, but that really is the concept there. If you go for a period of 30 months without both sides of a duplex being used, meaning one of those goes without use in that 30-month window, then you're, you've lost the legally non-conforming use. The item A component of this case is whether or not the zoning staff, zoning administrator erred in determining that there had in fact been a lapse of 30 months or more with one of the sides of the duplex use such that the grandfathered or legally non-conforming use had been lost and restoration of it, meaning a tear down, rebuild, alteration, or even continuation at this point, um, if, if the zoning staff, zoning administrator were right, then that legally non-conforming use is lost and we don't get to the item D analysis. Only if the board determines that the zoning staff, zoning administrator were incorrect in determining that there had been that discontinued use for a period of 30 months or more, would you then be able to get past item A and into the question of alteration of the structure and uh, continuous or rest restoration of duplex use at this location? Very simply, you got to get over the item A hump to get to the item D discussion. And, and on our on our agenda, it only talks about an item A and then a potential side setback, which the applicant has said they're not interested in pursuing today. But in their material, in their letter that they submitted to us, that uh, may have been in the material, but we got another copy of it today. It talks about an item D. There's no item D on the on the. I mean, if, if in fact the zoning staff was wrong about the determination that there was a discontinuation of use for 30 months, therefore it means that it has not lost its grandfathered rights or its legally nonconforming rights, then there's no appeal needed at the board. It would have been approved at a staff level. So that basically means you wouldn't have to take formal action on an item D at that point. It's just the analysis that is left after you make the determination on the item A. And because that can be handled at a staff level and does not require um, at least I have to review 1740650, and the zoning administrator may need to correct me there. But if it could be handled at the staff level, then it would be nothing for the board to have to hear. Okay. So I guess I'm back yeah. to my original question: is if if the zoning administrators, if they determine that it's been 
it has not been used for duplex for more than 30 months and your materials confirm that I'm just I'm not sure what your case is on an item a I mean well, it sounds like you both are in agreement that it hasn't been used for 30 months and so yeah, yeah. so when I went to codes um, I'm sorry the item a appeal wasn't explained that way it was just explained that hey it's been vacant for more than 30 months so now you have to go and and make the case that it will not be uh, um, any additional nuisance to the neighborhood to have it continue its use as a duplex. So that's why we're here. <laughs> yeah. So, are, and, and I will, I will say our, our chair, David Ewing, is here, so I, I will, I'm not chairing okay. the meeting anymore. I'll turn okay. that over to, okay. to our, our wonderful okay. chair. Questions? So are, are you saying uh, the entire building has been not in use for 30 months or just one of the units or the both? entire building has been vacant for longer than 30 months there um, I know the property owner has tried to pull you know NES records and like that and there it's been it has not been used for for longer than that period and so that's what we were told when we went to to codes and so we immediately went ahead and filed for the item D appeal to be able to continue the use yeah Any more questions uh, with the applicant? With the applic so how this work is works is you will have the remaining amount of time for rebuttal if you're finished with your primary. Case. Well, no, we weren't finished with our presentation. Okay. Well, okay. Then, well, then continue. <laughs> continue, please. So, um, so as part of the item D, we had to, you know, show that uh, by this continuing as a duplex use, that it would not be a further nuisance to the neighborhood. And I did want to address how we think that it would continue to be an asset to the neighborhood. Um, so maintaining a duplex on this property would not increase the, ingre the degree of nonconformity. A two-family legal non legally non-conforming structure would instead be conforming to the existing development pattern on this block. The two Excuse me. I don't, mm -hmm. Let me ask our zoning administrator, do we have the right after 30 months to keep something to be a duplex in this kind of case? Not in my opinion. So what we're saying is the Metro Council has passed this law saying that if it's not used for a duplex after uh, 30 months, it reverts back to the, what the base zoning is. Mm -hmm. This board only has the authority and power to decide the 30 days, you're still within the 30 days, but once the 30 days has lapsed and you've, 30 30 I mean months. 30 months, mm -hmm. once the 30 months has lapsed and you've acknowledged that, we don't have the authority or the power to say this can be used as a duplex. It sounds like that's your argument to us that even all those things that happened, I still want to use this as a duplex. Okay, I thought that was the basis of the item D. Appeal is to come in to t discuss why. Right. But an yeah. item D is if you know if if you have a non-conforming use that you want to make a different non-conforming use. You know, you have a florist and the and then you want to use it for another, you know, a popsicle stand or, or something, uh, then. You would come to us and say, "Hey, it's, I've got a non-conforming use. So it wants to be another non-conforming use. It goes to those those different things." But once once this was not a duplex for 30 months, it reverted back to its original zoning, and we don't have the authority it's to do current that. zoning. And I mean, to its current zoning, yeah. right? And, I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, it's current zoning, and so we don't have the authority <coughs> to allow you to do it as a to use it as a duplex under you know an item D. And again, that's that's that's. Presuming that we discuss it and, and vote whether or not uh, the zoning administrator was correct in, in his assessment, and that's why I kept asking. You both are in agreement, and you've testified today that it was vacant for 30 months. So, so far okay. there hasn't been anything that said that the zoning administrator was incorrect. So, they're probably and, and John can tell you, uh, it, mm -hmm. uh, and, and the codes can staff can tell you there may be other routes for you to go to to have a duplex here through some type of well, of. Uh, other other processes, but I don't see a path here. Were you paying the duplex rate on your taxes during this 30-month period or the previous people? No, the property was just acquired. But yeah. were the previous people paying the duplex tax rate? You wanna I don't know that. certainty. We okay. Check that out. John Michael, do you know anything about that? Although we have access to that information back at the office, I don't have that with me here. Okay. Okay, well, I apologize to the board. What I was told when we went to Coles and filed the application many months ago was this was what we 
had to do and the case that we had to make. Um, the case has been deferred several times so we could meet with the community. Um, and so this is really the first that I'm hearing that the path that we're taking is incorrect. Yeah. Well, yeah. we just don't have the authority to grant your relief. You know, once it's been out of the 30-day window, I mean, 30-month window, we don't have the authority. In previous cases like this, people come and say, oh, it actually wasn't 30 months because of X, Y, and Z. And those are the kind of cases that we hear. But if it's been 30 months, there's really nothing that this board can do. Yeah, I mean, I would, okay. I would to, again, it would, the, the coach department can help you. Your council person could probably help you. And there probably are, are ways that you can, uh, there are paths that you can have to go to have a duplex. But in terms of the reason here, I don't, I don't see that. But anyway, you, you have an opportunity to, to, to address this item A, which we may have, and if there's opposition, but. Or you can just draw your appeal of item A, which is challenging the administrator. So the item A appeal is your, we have to decide whether our zoning administrator is correct or incorrect his letter, what he has said. And so that's basically what item A is. It's just yay or nay. Did he make a mistake or didn't he? Okay. No, I, I understand. <laughs> I understand that. Um, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm a little thrown aback because when we started this process, it was, okay, the duplex use has lapsed and, you know, this is the process that you, you take to make the argument that it should continue its use. And that's the, that's the path we've been on for the last three or four months. <laughs> and was never really told anything different, so. Have you spoken yeah. to your council person? About yeah, it? yeah. Okay. Yeah. Maybe um, David was saying there were um, perhaps some other options for you. Maybe you speak to your council person, um, you go with them to planning department, maybe you can get a specific plan, SP zoning. I don't know, I'm just wanting yeah, to yeah, throw that out for you. Yeah, it sounds like you've done a lot of work. Yeah, we have. <laughs> uh, Mr. Chairman. Okay. It sounds like there's been some confusion that I was not aware of regarding um, how the application of this appeal was processed. And so if, if the applicant uh, was amenable to deferring one meeting, I would be happy to sit down and, and talk to you and talk you through that process and also talk to you about any other possibilities mm -hmm. that there may be for this property. I would be happy to do that. Um, I was not aware of this process until yesterday afternoon, and mm -hmm. so I'll be happy. If you wanted to defer one meeting, I'd be happy in the meantime, sit down and talk about it and explain what other remedies may be available to you. Okay. Is that your wish? Yes, okay. yes, let's at least talk with. So um, is there any discussion about deferring it, or do I hear a motion about deferring this one meeting? No, I, I, would, I would just, as we defer it one meeting, I would, I would also like for when it to come when it comes back, if it's possible, just to be presented with from the zoning administrator a resolution. If if the applicant agrees that there's no basis from item A, I don't I don't want us to have to go through hearing mm -hmm. it again and all that kind of thing. I think you know just saying, you know, hey, we deferred it. Sure. It you know the item A is not you know stand you know. I think you know what I'm saying. <laughs> so, but anyway, it can go and, to the front. And the other things that we can look into if the previous owner paid the duplex taxes, if there was, I don't know what the inside of this building looks like. I mean, other things that you could talk to Mr. Herbert about that mm -hmm. as far as coming back to us. So do I hear a motion? Please. So oh, to defer. To defer. Yeah, well, let's close. Let's. Did the opposition with the well, you know, Let's hear from the, okay. So um, could you step aside and we'll hear briefly mm -hmm. from the opposition that's here. Okay. Uh, uh, I'm Carl Meyer. I'm, uh, I live at 2407 Hyman Street. How, how do you spell your name? Uh, K-A-R-L-M-E-Y-E-R. -E -E okay. I'm the um, president and coordinator of Nashville Greenlands Community, which is an intentional community. We have uh, four houses on uh, Hyman Street at 2004 Hyman Street. 2403, 2407, and 2409 that we have purchased, and two other houses in the near neighborhood, 
that we have purchased over the last 20 years and restored these vacant, deteriorating houses for very affordable housing. I'm also the uh, uh, elected recording secretary of the North Nashville Organization for Community Improvement. And uh, we participated in the uh, sub-area eight planning meetings and in the Nashville Next meetings in which this area of Hyman Street remains zoned RS5 with neighborhood maintenance. Okay, and so we've met uh, with the, uh, with the uh, developer twice and we've met twice and voted so in unanimously in our NNOCI meetings. So and Mr. Meyer, I have two questions. Um, yeah. And we're, what, what, I would be, I would what? say that I don't see any point in deferring this since the, uh, we didn't know about this technicality when we met with the developer. I've even suggested to them today that uh, an SP zoning we might go along with. We negotiated with them. We were kind of willing to go along with this. Uh, okay, um, well, we could defer. Houses. We could defer. And but I don't see me. any point in deferring it. Okay, well, um, but since, uh, of course, I'll be back if you do defer. Yeah, since there was some confusion, we're going to err on the side of hopefully they can kind of talk to our staff and maybe the council member and you again to come up with some solution or resolution to this or some other scenario. And, and in regard to the condition of the building and whether it has been vacant for 30 months, mm -hmm. we, we live right, one of our members lives right almost next door to this and we pass it every day for years. This house has been vacant. I went into the house, it's just uh, shabby and uh, just totally, uh, most people would say it needs the bulldozer, although we took houses like that and restored. Sorry to interrupt you, but we can't so even discuss that. There's no point. doubt that it's right. been vacant at least. Okay, but your, so your testimony is, 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 that testimony relates directly to the item eight appeal, which is, whether or not it's been vacant for 30 months, and you're testifying here that it has. And you, it, because you, I mean, you, you're, you're, that's what you just said. <laughs> it yeah. Been, okay. Yeah. Everyone said. But it looks like, so do you have anything else to add? So no, we're, no, I okay. just don't so see let, any point in deferring. Okay, let's close the public hearing discussion about, um, do we have a motion? Well, I, I move that we uh, defer this to the next meeting. Okay, motion's been made. Is there a second? A second. Okay, motion is made properly seconded. Any further discussion on this? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? This will be deferred one meeting, and uh, in the meantime, the applicant will talk to Mr. Herbert and zoning staff about this. <coughs> Next case, John Mike. Next case for the board's consideration is actually 2017, number 184, forgive the typo, Barry Cleveland, the appellant, and Henry Martin, the owner of the property at 1732 Glen Echo Road seeking variances from the contextual street setback requirements in the R10 zoning district. The plan submitted, aerial view here in this part of Green Hills, plan submitted demonstrates the uh, proposed development of the three lots with a duplex on each. Uh, the contextual street setback at this location shows to be 80, 80, 80 feet off of Glen Echo. Um, and the proposal submitted by the appellant is for 40, 50, and 60 respectively as you go from left to right as shown on this site plan. Um, the site visit from much sunnier days than the one we have today demonstrates the condition of the subject property today. And then the views uh, up and down the street to the left and right here with the upper left hand corner showing the view directly across the street. Again, this is an R10 zoning district. Uh, the appellants with opposition present will have 15 minutes to make their desired presentation to the board. And if you'll give me one moment, Mr. Chairman, I have one other slide that's been submitted and I'll try to pull that up for you as uh, Mr. Biddle gets started on behalf of the presentation. My name is John Brittle. I'm a realtor in Nashville. I live at 1506 Fourth Avenue North, and I represent uh, Glen Echo Cottages, then LLC. It's no longer Mr. Martin. That's uh, that didn't get changed. The property did, in fact, that's who the applicant was when we were here previously. But the property has traded, um, so I did want to correct that on the. I don't know if we need to do that on the application, John Michael, but we have, it's a, there's a new owner. Um, I believe you received a letter from Mr. Dean who represents the owner. And 
Okay, we're going to hand you a copy of that. Uh, George Dean couldn't be here today. He represents the property owner. Um, this property is now an approved three lot subdivision from the planning, the Metro Planning Commission. It's not been recorded yet, but it has been approved. And oh, could you explain? It's not been approved, but it is approved? No, it's not been recorded, but it is oh, recorded. Okay. I'm sorry, I may have misspoken. It, it's not been recorded, it will be right away, but it, it has been approved. And I, I would just like a, a couple of notes about our request to change these setbacks. As you can see from that slide, the house that faces the other way, that's, that 35 feet represents the distance off of the right away of our next door neighbor who actually faces Hillmont the other direction, which would be left there. Um, and the house to our right is 75 or 77 feet back. And what our goal here is to produce a stair step that gives us building envelopes that are not restricted because of the shape of this lot. And I heard we had a really good hour and a half long or more neighborhood meeting with Councilman Pulley and about 20 neighbors uh, on a night, one of those snowy nights, uh, or the start of a snowstorm back in December or in, in the first part of this month. And some, some of the comments that we heard was that this was a self-imposed hardship. And so we went and talked to Mr. Dean about what a self-imposed hardship is, and he explained it to me, and I am not an attorney, um, that this hardship of this lot, because it's 130 to, it's 130 feet deep on the left side, it is the only lot in the entire neighborhood shaped like that because of the way the roads curve, and that 130 feet with an 80-foot front setback and a 20-foot rear setback is a hardship whether this was one lot or two lots or three lots and that the shape of the lot when it was created in 1948 is what created the hardship here. And we, whether we put one house or two on that left lot or whether we created two homes here or six, the whole left half of this lot has a hardship. That is why we're asking for different depths because the only trees that really deserve to be saved that aren't hackberry trees on this property are in the back left corner right in the very back left. I wouldn't really call it a corner, but in that back piece is the three trees we're trying to save. And so what we've done, um, after the neighborhood meeting, the majority of the neighbors said to me and the council member that their concerns were about front-facing driveways, I'm sorry, front-facing garages and parking pads out in the front of the building envelopes of the homes, that they did not want that on Glen Echo. I understand that. We went and hired Mr. Cleveland, our engineer, to show us what the footprints, what the site plan could look like, because the planning department was very clear when they approved our subdivision unanimously, and that was that they don't want parking pads out in front of the front of these homes. I, as a residential realtor, I agree wholeheartedly. We, we don't need to drive down streets and see 12 houses parked out, 12 cars parked out in front of houses. So we have agreed to a 16 foot max on driveways and we have shown in this drawing that is not what we know we're gonna build, it's just a concept plan to show the councilman and the neighbors that in fact we can get side load garages or even get around to the back potentially if we have setbacks of 40, 50, and 60. And so we took that to them and with the exception of two or three out of 20 or 25, everyone said, if you make it where there's no parking pads out front and we don't have any front load garages, we're okay. In fact, we added an additional, we're proposing adding an additional 10 feet to the rear and giving us a 30 foot rear setback because our neighbors on the left and the first two on the back corner have told us in no uncertain terms, if you can get them a little further away from us and save some trees, then we, you know, we're okay. We don't want to see cars. We don't want to see garage doors facing the street. And so we did that. And I would like to note that this is a neighborhood evolving policy, not neighborhood maintenance. And this is a collector within a half a mile of the regional activity center. And that we met 
not only the requirements, we didn't have to meet the lot comparability requirements, but we did and would have even if this had been neighborhood maintenance. So the lot sizes were perfectly fine with planning. The shape, because of the way it was shaped in 1948, means that we didn't create the hardship. And I, I would just like to make a note that I'm disappointed when I'm told that I'm threatening neighbors or an association or anybody when we tell what the builder or the owner of the property can build in the current situation. And with this limited envelope on at least the whole left half of this property, the developer is very likely going to go to codes and get a permit for joined HPRs, which can be three stories and 45 feet tall. And, and he asked me to come here again today on his dime with his engineer and his attorney and to meet with the neighbors and show that we could do something that was better and looked better because when we separate HPRs in Nashville, in this part of town, their height is determined by one and a half times their width. And so we want to detach them. We want to have garages that don't face the street. We don't want parking pads in the front of the houses. And we respectfully request that due to saving some trees and for configuration purposes and the shape of the lot that you grant our variance on the front setbacks. And, and so I, I take it from your testimony that you have no opposition to uh, requirements of this setback being no front facing garages or parking pads. Absolutely. Okay. And I've told some of the neighbors that today. We just received the letter from George Dean, so I'm trying to process through it. Oh, yes, ma'am. Um, and I'm just reading from it. Um, it says the shape of the slot was created almost 50 years before the effective date of current zoning ordinance. It's not self-created under the terms of the zoning regulations. But this lot, a couple months ago, so there was one big lot a couple months ago, and now it's since been divided mm -hmm. into three small lots. Is that mm -hmm. correct? Yes, ma'am. Right. Okay. So you said you mentioned Council Person Russ Pulley. We've talked to him. Is he? What's he? Uh, Russ, uh, Council Member Pulley uh, has done what I believe I would do and anybody would do because he's. Uh, seems like a very straightforward guy to me. Mm -hmm. And I believe that the majority of the people who've contacted him have said to him, we don't want them to change this setback. And I believe that they're saying that, well, I know because they said it to me, they said, we don't want you to build six houses there. I'm the realtor, I'm gonna be representing the builder. Um, that, that has been answered by the Planning Commission and we have the ability to do that. What we're trying to do with the neighbors who wanted to make it look better and fit their community better was take the front load garages off, not have parking pads out in the front and get them separated, which will also bring the height down and save the trees. And the, I don't know his opinion exactly personally, but I do believe that the majority of people told him they were not for this setback change. Mr. Chairman, uh, Councilman Pulley contacted me immediately before the meeting and said that he wishes to stand by his previous letter that should be contained in the file from the previous hearing, that he stands by that letter okay. in opposition. Okay, thank you. Anything else to add? Um, or no, sir, thank we, you. So mm -hmm. you'll have seven minutes and nine seconds left for thank rebuttal you. after the opposition. Uh, Thank you very please much. Please identify yourself. Uh, Barry Cleveland at 95 Whitebridge Road, Nashville. Okay, and you are the applicant? Yes. Okay, thank you. We'll see you soon. So you're from the opposition here. You will have 15 minutes combined, so come up front. And if one person speaks or five people speak, combined you have 15 minutes. Hmm? No, come on. You all could come up. There are three seats here, four seats. You could sit. I'm Susan McDonald, and I live in the neighborhood directly across the street. I'm Glen Echo. What's your address? Um, 
398 Glen West Drive. Okay. The Homeowner Association Board of Directors authorized me to speak for the HOA, at least at the last meeting before it was continued, but I think that authorization continues. Um, I think we all had a lot of different issues, so I want to address my main one, which is that for this matter, the developer owner, I'm not sure who the players are, but whoever went to planning and devised the three lots to divide the parcel, and then also, according to the planning commission minutes, accepted the conditions imposed by the staff, which were no front parking and one other condition. So, um, but now those two conditions imposed by planning are the basis of the hardship in the initial letter for this appeal. Um, so here we have a developer owner who created the lots, devised how the lots were developed, who arranged, sized, and accepted the conditions and now comes and says those lot sizes and the um, conditions that they accepted at planning constitute a hardship. I think that ends the question because I haven't seen the letter that they circulated a few minutes ago, but it seems that... Um, that's not a hardship as this board has explained in the standards for a variance. It's nothing but self-imposed, apparently for financial gain. And um, I think if there's not a hardship, as that term is defined, I think the board cannot approve the variance. And that's my primary issue. So the applicant basically said, you know, if he doesn't get the variances from us, he's just going to build these houses the way he described. So what do you think about that? Um, I think I'm the one who considered that a threat because I felt like he was saying, if you don't agree, if you don't um, withdraw your objections to the variance, we will build six skinny, flat-roofed, three-story buildings. Well, and what do you think about I mean, if under the law, let's assume that he can do that. So, And I don't know if that can be done, assuming it can. I can't imagine that someone who, in their appeal to you, at, at, to this board, says they're interested in the harmonious feel of the neighborhood, would build those houses, because that would be completely inconsistent with anything else on that street. In my objection um, that I think y'all have, I walked up and down the street and took pictures of how lovely Glen Echo is. Um, there are no houses that have front parking. Um, and a reduced setback. It's a lovely street. If you put these, um, if you crowd six houses into a lot that doesn't need six houses, I mean, I, I would prefer that the builder go back to planning and say that he now objects to those conditions and divide this lot properly into two lots rather than three. It's that, that is the self-imposed, self-created hardship. No, well, I guess the, the question I have was that, um, let, let me hype it, and, and I don't think that that's possible. It, it, it might be wonderful, but I'm not. I, but but let's say hypothetically, this were two lots instead of three. The one on the left still, if it's bound by that setback requirement of 80 feet, makes it essentially an unbuildable lot. And I mean, this this board has been very sympathetic to folks that come with unbuildable lots based on a countywide rule that uh, creates averages that sometimes on lots like this uh, make that uh, inappropriate. And so what would, what would the appropriate setback be for a home there? If there were just four, ho four houses on that primary lot, um, I think they could build, be built in a way that was consistent with the, the street and even if they had reduced setbacks. There are houses with reduced setbacks on the street. They just don't have front entrances for cars. And I think a si the, the revised plan that the developer submitted does have um, garages in the back for the two, those two lots. And on the left-hand lot, though, there is a garage that is in the front of the house. So there's still going to be the parking and, mess and right there. Right, so it's, at some point we will have to determine what is the appropriate setback for the, the three lots or, or two lots. We don't have any control over someone's ability to build one or two homes on a piece of property. Um, I mean, that, that's set by code, and so we, we, it, a density question really isn't something that we can address because it's not what uh, we have the authority to address today. It's really what is the appropriate front-back setback. Uh, if they'd come and, and ask for a side setback, 
I, you, I think an argument of, of being uh, self-imposed might really apply because they're the ones that divided it into three. But they're not talking about side, they're talking about front to back. But So I guess the question, I mean, I, when I looked at the site plan, um, as far as these things go, and it's happening all over town, and it's a, a concern for a lot of folks, and uh, I've expressed concern about this type of thing before, but at the same time, we have rules that everybody has to to follow. And and when I look at the site plan, and I see six homes with only two driveways, and, and most of the garages, you know, three of the six garages in the back, I think, wow, nobody really does that. <laughs> seems kind of nice and and when I looked at the overhead and I saw the three houses to the right of it that had three big driveways and parking pads I thought man this may you know this this might actually be something better than what other folks have to do based on their lot so I guess I really do want to understand what more the opposition what what is the basis of this and and if 85 feet makes these lots unbuildable in a front to back setback what is acceptable and what because you, you can't, we can't just say, hey, you're, you, you can't build on your lot. If you have a lot that big, you know, whether you build one house or two houses, that's up to them, but there has to be some ability to say, where can you build? And my question would be, can any developer divide a parcel into lots in a way that, that makes it hard to build as a justification to get the variance the developer wants? I guess I'm, I'm not, and we can talk about this as a, a board, I'm, I'm not hearing the, the hardship in, in the same way. I'm, I'm, I'm not hearing a narrowness, I'm hearing a front to back and, and the fact that it's kind of, I don't remember what kind of shape you'd call that, but where, you know, even, even if it were one house and, and you know, the house that was there, it appeared didn't have much of a backyard at all. If, if they were to build one house on the old lot, I wouldn't be surprised if they came and said, we need a front setback because we can't go back 85 feet to build a single home. And so that their hardship really is, has to do with that diagonal line in the back of the lot as, as, I, as I read it. And so that's really kind of where I'm struggling. And, and don't get me wrong, I understand mm -hmm. the concerns that you all have and there's an awful lot of folks that have those concerns and I appreciate that too. I just I really want to understand if they have a right to, to build certain things that we have no control over, uh, this really is about how far away from the road can they build. And I said at the community meeting, I do not have an objection if the garages are in the back. And the developer builder said that he would come up with a plan for that, and he, the plan he came up with had the um, garages for the far left house in the front. But I would not have an objection with the reduced setback if all the garages and entrances are in the back because that's consistent with the way the street looks. And it's a lovely street. No, it is. And, and, and I guess the, the question back to, to all of the group uh, is why, why is this unreasonable if it goes from 35 to 40 to 50 to 60 and then the, then the next row which it looked like they were all in line is around 75 so help me understand why why this would be an unreasonable request and um, my objection is the garage in the front but i don't speak for these and you you spoke first i didn't mean to put you on the spot <laughs> but i really do want to get to to really understand so i whatever we decide it's you feel like we've heard all sides and it's respectful of the opinions of all sides so next, who's next, and please identify yourself and address for the record. That's me. It's me. Okay, hi, my name is Seth Hoffman. I reside at 412 Glen West, which is right across the street from these homes. Um, I echo what was just described by Susan as it relates to it being self-imposed. They agreed to what the MPC put on them and now are changing their minds. And if th this property has been here a long time. I mean, it sounds to me like a negligence of due diligence. I mean, they knew that how the property was laid out. Do your due diligence. If you can't build the six there, build less. Um, I think that changing the, the setbacks is a problem throughout Nashville, right around the corner from here. There's a big eyesore of a setback change that was made on Benham. I think it's gonna reduce the value of the homes in this area, and I don't understand why the um, why one developer's 
um, uh, uh, development and, and the needs that they have trump the rest of the neighborhood who've been here a long time before this property was even for sale. Um, furthermore, I think that public welfare and, and health is an issue. You got a very busy street of Glen Echo between Hillmont and Belmont. You're 100 yards, that property is 100 yards or less from a public school where there's a lot of kids walking around. You're gonna start squeezing a street that is heavily trafficked at high speeds and squeeze the distance between the sidewalk or the road and how much a pedestrian has on a sidewalk for safety reasons to, to, to move back. I mean, it doesn't make any sense at all to me. And I, I just don't understand how um, this could be approved given that 75 setback and you know the discrepancy in the neighborhood. Let's have a little continuity here. Six houses on one lot, if he's got the right to do it, go ahead. If he wants to build three, or those six in a, in a manner which he claims himself, it sounds like he doesn't even think that that would look good. Go ahead. I don't know why you'd want to do that and come in here and claim you're trying to be harmonious with the neighbors. Developers come, they build, and they go, and the residents have to live with the consequences. Thank you. Okay, who's next? I'm Jana Sinclair. I live at 1724 Glen Echo Road. It's about four houses down. It's a townhome, a zero lot line. I'm against the whole variant setback for a couple of reasons, everything you've already heard. But also I'm wondering how, I mean, I have trouble keeping up with the whole process and how things are done. But all I know is there are a lot of variances and a lot of exceptions requested along the way in the past, you know, I've been there for many, many years now. And it seems like the guidelines that are put in place, the variance, I mean, the guidelines or whatever all the laws are, they're put in place for a reason. And as, you know, every builder and all of you guys up there, as all these uh, variances are granted, it's like it renders the law or the original guideline, you know, it just weakens it. What is the point of even having the law? And I think furthermore, if it, you know, if you continue to do that, I mean, the whole system, you know, there's always this pressure of, changing the rule, the existing rule, it just kind of erodes the trust of like, well, what is the purpose of the law? I mean, if you, if you continue to just grant all these exceptions case by case by case, I mean, I'm against this particular one, you know, for personal reasons. I don't think it'll look as good. I think it's inconsistent. I think it's self-imposed too. I mean, I agree with him. He knew, he knew what the, I mean, they knew what the building standards were that have changed from 40 years ago before they asked for it. He should have done his due diligence. It's a self-imposed, you know, hardship. I think it's, you know, they knew that they, I, I just think it's planned. It's, all, it's obviously strategized to cram more people in there. I also disagree with his comments that he made about, you know, we had a great community meeting and everybody was in agreement and all the neighbors, you know, that's one presentation of it. People, I was at both of those, there were two meetings held and one only four people showed up. It wasn't widely advertised. And the second one is the ones he, he's referring to where there were more, but people were not in 100% agree. I mean, it wasn't, from my experience, I don't think it was as positive as he said. Of course, I'm, you know, wanting something different, but. Ma'am, you said you live four doors down. I do. And so is, is your home more in line with that 75 foot? I'm further back. I'm okay, further, you're further than back. 85 feet. So that, and that's one reason I chose my place. I love being off the street because it is busy. And, and I, I, you know, I'm sad to see the changes that have happened on Glen Echo at the bottom of this. I mean, I don't know where the appropriate, you know, you get tired of complaining and always being the person who's like, you know, this is awful because I'm not sure which people need to hear it. But the stuff they've done at the bottom of Glen Echo where you take a walk now, you're walking in people's living room. It's like you walk by and it's like right there. I mean, I understand it's the, you know, it's the evolving thing. New people come, they, they see what they like, they buy what they like at that point and then everything changes. So that's happening all the time. You know, Nashville's booming, that's great. But it goes back to, I thought we had some rules or guidelines, however all this stuff works. It's not working because everybody's just, you know, going at it piece by piece what they want to do. And it comes down to, you know, who's going to, who's going to, at these meetings. I mean, I'm not sure how it works, but it's like, what, what's up with the rules? There aren't any rules. The rules are who's going to, you know, be able to get off work and come down and pull together a case and something that's not your field. It's like, it's very frustrating. The other thing about Glen Echo, it's, this probably isn't the right place to bring this up, but some of the development across the street, right on one of those curves, it's like they've widened the street. 
and they've started, they have started parking there, and now all the traffic kind of slows down. I mean, I've put, I've gone online and done something, but it's like, what was up with that? Is there, you know, are you guys trying to plan parking on Glen Echo now? I mean, it's not a street to park on, because anyway, that's a whole different subject. But I'm against the variance. I don't, I don't want to see houses. I don't want to live in a totally urban place where. I feel like I'm in uh, Manhattan or something where all the buildings are just on both sides of the street walking down. I mean, I'd like to see super blocks with few cars. You know, I'm going to move that direction, not. You know. so, okay. Thank you for listening. My name is Keith Mowney. Uh, last name's M A U N E. I'm at 1781 Hillmont Drive, so I'm immediately to the left on the house that's got the side setback of about 35 feet uh, on the picture. Uh, you know, I went to these community meetings. Um, I, I could definitely see how some people heard the, the ideas as a threat. Regardless of how it was taken, I think the fact is, you know, it, it did get subdivided at this point into three lots. So I think there's either going to end up being, you know, six houses or, or you know, some combination of duplexes and, or in, in houses on these lots. So I'm just looking at, you know, given where we are now, what's the best possible development? Um, I think John put forth pretty good effort at trying to accommodate the whole garage situation. I was in the camp of being worried about front-loading garages. He came back with a plan. Um, we flipped through the slide quickly, but I, I, I know it was part of the presentation. There was a plan that he came up with where... Excuse me, can we go back to that slide? Well, uh, you can keep going. I'm yeah, sorry. so uh, while you're pulling that up, um, I think the three on the right had rear loading garages. The three on the left did have garages in front, but they were side loading. Uh, to me, I would be okay with that. Um, where I would draw the line is I really don't want front loading garages. Um, if they do side loading, I, I think you can probably still make it pretty good uh, looking in front, where it doesn't just look like a whole row of you know garage doors facing you as you, as you go down the road. So yeah, that's what he proposed. Uh, and he told me that he would be able to agree to some sort of condition that if he got this variance, it would be a condition that, you know, it needs to be bound to the property that would run with the land that would prevent, you know, even if they flip a couple of these lots to someone else for development, you know, something that runs with the land that prohibits front loading garages. Uh, and if that can be done and attached to the variance, I'd support doing what he planned. Okay. Um, um, I have skimmed through this letter now, and I don't think it addresses um, whether it's a hardship when you create the lots. I think this letter only says that it would that the shape of a lot can be a hardship. It does not, and analysis of whether something is a hardship has to be in the context of how it's presented. Here it's presented in the context of it is a hardship to build houses on these three separate lots. It's not presented in the context of its um, difficult or hard to build on the original parcel. Is there anyone else here that wants to speak on this case in opposition? Okay. I had one other question sure, about, of course. Um, if this were, to, I mean, would this set a precedent? I mean, is there any way, I don't want it to be approved, but that's another one of my concerns. Will it set a precedent for the future development on Glen Echo? Well, you know, they did it at the top of the street. Why can't we do it? Why can't we do, you know, 12 lots with, you know, it's it's just. Well, this whole. has been a two step process. Obviously, the Planning Commission uh, weighed in on this, and then we would have to. We don't set precedent on FARS. Each individual case is stand on its own and has its own set of facts. That doesn't mean some developer that comes along and sees what the trend in the neighborhood will come by and try to do that or attempt to do that, but they have to go through the same process if, depending on the zoning and the street and the lot. Any other questions for the op I Yes. I have another question. Um, will this, if y'all approve this, will it go back to planning to confirm whether this particular plan is consistent with the conditions imposed by planning? Because I'm not sure. No. no. Yes. Yeah, but the, were the conditions, the conditions were no uh, front-facing garages and no parking pads in the front, I believe. Is that? It was limiting the cuts on the street to two, 
and then also said um, I'm sorry, it was limiting to what? Limited the cut, the driveway entrances okay. on the street the to curb one cuts. addition. <laughs> And then also no non-permeable parking in the front. And I'm, I can't tell from looking at that plan if the little speckled area, which I assume is concrete, is um, would constitute a non-permeable parking pad under in planning's view. Okay. Any questions for the opposition? Do you have anything else to add? Okay. Thank you. Let's hear from the applicant again. <coughs> John Michael, do you have an aerial, please? Did we have that? Um, you can't see it really well, but the houses across the street from us are 20 to 30 feet off the road. And this is what I deal with on a regular basis in my chosen career is I've got some people who are 80 or 85 feet off the road that don't want them close, and I've got other people who are 20 feet off the street, and they just had the benefit of taking away two homes and replacing it with 16 before they bought their homes. And the zero lot lines down the street were also subdivided. And that's what the community plan is about. And that's what was done when that neighborhood was built across. And that what was done when those zero lot lines were built down the street in the 80s. And Mrs. Martin just happened to be the last holdout. And we, um, I, I believe there is, I would like to clarify that those houses to our right, um, those garages are in the front, but those are not front load garages in the way that I believe planning discusses it in the way most neighbors talk about it. And that's why we, if maybe it's called a courtyard garage or something, um, and they have, they've got six, eight parking pads out in front of those houses. But uh, in the next two, also the zero lot lines also have parking. We agreed with planning and we accepted the condition not to put parking pads out front. I believe that that driveway that accesses house first on our plan is actually less than 16 feet wide and that's why they put that 16 foot wide restriction on us so that it wouldn't be parking pads. We can, and I would like to just say for the record, this is a concept that we put together to show planning, and we, and we showed it to planning this week, that we could get this many homes, this many driveways, this many garage access. We're talking about ingress, egress over there on that left lot. And that could happen on the right lot or even the middle lot. We don't have to put them in the back. We were just trying to see if we could. And as long as those driveways going across those front of those houses don't max, don't exceed 16 feet, and as long as those garages don't face the front, we'll still be meeting codes and planning's intent and what's on our plat. So I didn't want anyone to be able to say, well, he said they were gonna put rear garages on them. They may all be courtyards, but we won't have any facing the street. There won't be any garage doors facing the street, and there won't be any, there won't be any parking pads, just access driveways. Okay. Clearly, this isn't the first time you heard from the opposition, and they're pretty set in what they believe in. So how do you respond to that? And you know, you've kind of alluded to if you don't get this variance, you're just going to build these six houses on this lot. I imagine that the two on lot three will look very similar to how they look right here. And the two in the middle, um, I wish I had something that showed you an 80 foot setback, but it's about where the front of that little, the white house that's gonna be demolished is on that aerial right there. Mm -hmm. uh, a little bit farther back than the man to the right, um, who's at about 75. And we, um, I, I would like to add that it's really difficult to get neighbors to come out because they support something. Not sure it's even feasible. But, but as you know, I mean, we've probably got 30 letters of opposition. Uh, yes, sir. And those people, um, almost to a person, were against six homes. They were against front load garages. They were against parking in the front. And we've addressed all of that. And I haven't heard anybody tell me why going from 35 to 75 and stair stepping it, well, unless they live 20 feet off, I do believe in Mr. Dean's opinion of the legal matter that that shape of that lot when this was all platted in the 40s gave it a hardship that it will live with for the rest of time 
And if my client decides to build a single family on that left one, I'll determine uh, with Mr. Herbert if we're gonna come back and ask for a 50 foot or a 45, because we're gonna be looking for some help even if we build three houses here. So there, I believe the answer is that the Planning Commission answered density. They answered where the parking could be. We've shown that we can do it and we respectfully request a variance based on what is next to us and based on some trees that you can see in that video that, or in that picture that I do not want to cut down. I mean, I guess I understand the kind of cart and horse situation of, yes, sir. of you understanding what this board will allow as a variance helps you to know what you can do. But I just heard you say that it was possible that you could build three single family homes and then you might come back and there's something to me about granting a variance that comes with some level of certainty, you know, for the neighbors. Well, and so, you know, that was the first time it was mentioned that it might be a, I, I, a three I single family home. I misspoke. I meant to say, <laughs> if we were going, if we're going to build three houses, we need a variance too. Right. But, but we don't intend to. I, he intends to build six and they could be joined or they, they could be attached or detached. And we're trying to show that, and by the way, the, the subdivision does not preclude us from building front load garages. It keeps us from putting parking pads out in the front, but it doesn't keep us from building front load garages. And it just limits us to 16 feet of width. And we just we want to build something prettier and that fits the neighborhood. And the variance request is based on where those trees are sadly and the way that this lot doesn't have the depth of everything else in the neighborhood and as you said if it had been one and the two and a half million dollar house that would have gone there we would have need a variance so the, i guess the question is what um the question i have is what you're asking for you know for, uh, 40 50 and 60 um, what is the most that it could be and for you to still do what you want to do? Well, I appreciate that. I, the architect has not worked on this yet because we were trying to determine what, um, the minimums, I believe we could do 45 and 55 and 65 and still give the additional 10 in the back if we, if I back it up any more, I'm going to need to take away this making the back set back 30 feet. I'm going to need to just keep the 20. And, that, and, and just let me speak, and that is coming from the rear property owner's perspective, you know, not wanting to see, you know, a big uh, house in their backyard. Um, and we understand that. And so we're trying to work both both sides of the road, if you might say, the rear property owners and then the front ones as well, and try to make a, a good, clean uh, transition from the corner lot house all the way up to the existing home on the right of our development. So, anyway. I think that's what I had. Any other questions for the applicant? Okay, we'll close the public hearing. Thank you. Thank you. Discussion. Well, I am not in agreement with the variance request. Um, I did my own, I know this is not official, I did my own look at it using this graphic scale on their survey. And I don't think the lots are unbuildable. Um, I mean, the one that's number one, it would be very tight, so. But the other two are, they have a buildable footprint. May not be two houses, it may just be one house, but it's buildable. Um, also the odd shape of the lot at the back was a known condition when the property was subdivided. So to me that's still a self-imposed hardship, or it was a known, it was something that was known um, before it was subdivided. Christina, will you tell me, I mean, since you've done the math, how, how, when you say buildable, I don't 
don't know. <laughs> okay. All right. the, my my eyes aren't as good, but I can still see what you say. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I tell you, the one thing you know. Does it, and I don't. I didn't get the council member's letter. I mean, I've looked through my. If, if someone has it, I, yeah, I'd like I, to see it. I, and I've looked through that packet twice, and I really wanted to see what the council member had to say. Here, uh, I have it. Um, he says, or do you want to pass it? Mm -hmm. I'll continue. I had a question for, and I wish I could see the bulk regulations, but I, I, I think I'm going to leave that one. But I, I wish we had those, um, those handy, the district bulk tables, but we don't. Okay. That's correct. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I tend to always think, I mean, I, I, I do appreciate the, sh the sizes of the lots. I do think that people have a right to build uh, on lots that are, you know, 0 0.2 acres is certainly a, a, a buildable lot. And I also very much appreciate the drawing that you shared to say, hey, no, this, th is it buildable or not? But the thing that is um, bugging me a little bit about this, especially given the, the council members' opposition and the substantial number of people that, uh, and neighbors that are opposed to it, is the hypothetical nature of the proposal. I mean, if, if this specifically was absolutely what was going to be built and they done the neighbors, and we talked about 45, 55, 65, or 40, 50, 60, uh, it's a little bit different than saying, well, give me that setback, and then I'm going to go see what the demand is, and and then I'm going to decide, you know, we, we, I know that the applicant said they misspoke, but is it one, two, or three? But they also said, is it detached or not detached, which doesn't seem to, based on their testimony, to be settled. And there's something about that that, that um, again, given the impact that the neighbors have expressed that it will have on their uh, situation, it, it makes me a little wary because I, I do think people have a right to know what, what's going to happen. And this is a... Maybe not. This might be a typical kind of case that here you have a developer that wants to build some way and needs some variances, but if they don't get the variances, they could still build on the lot. It might not be aesthetically pleasing to some. And the neighbors or the people in opposition, you know, know that and they're still in opposition. I didn't really hear anybody saying, well, you know, I'll go with what the developer said because. I think that that's a better option than the base zoning on this property. So as you noticed in our packet, we have 30 letters of opposition of people live in the neighborhood and including the council person. So this is one of these cases, like you said, you don't really, the developer can build something and probably will build something on this lot. So it's, but, but when you ask for a variance, a variance is deviating from what the law says and you have to have a hardship and you have to have a good excuse and for many cases you have to have community support I, I agree with that but I would comment that all a majority of the letters of opposition are opposed to having six homes which is allowed I mean so the opposition is really driven by the number of structures and not as much by the variance the setback although that's part of it as well. And so we often are faced with these cases where the developer has the ability to build six homes, period, whether we grant the variance or not. They can put something on that property, as I understand it. Can I, do you mind if I interrupt? Mm -hmm. This is why I was wondering about the, I think it's the district land use tables. I thought that something that zoned R, like R80 through R6, I think you're not you're permitted to build two families two family as long as you meet conditions you're not permitted by right to build two I see John is checking let's hear from our zoning administrator so under the R zonings um, two family is a use permitted with conditions the conditions generally are 
and John, you can read them specifically, but generally was the um, lot created and of record prior to August 1 of 1984. And can I ask you there, this, these are three new lots, so they weren't created before 1984. Is that right? So there's other conditions. The okay. next one um, says that, or you have a lot that has been subdivided into no more than three lots when the original piece of property was created prior to August 1 of 1984. Now I'm paraphrasing here. And then there's a couple of other conditions. This one, um, I'm pretty confident that the planning department looked at that when they considered the subdivision process. Um, so. And originally Green Hills had at least one acre lots. It was not part of Nashville's and Davidson County and you had septic tanks. That's why you need your acre lot. So that's the original part of all these old lots. I, I think that, uh, I, I think the letter that we got uh, explaining their position from Mr. Dean on the, uh, on the hardship, I think, I think that would apply at minimum to the lot on the, on the left uh, because it, it is unique in an odd shape in, in the neighborhood. So I'm not saying it doesn't apply to the middle and the, the left lot, the, uh, the one, two, three, I'm sorry, two and three. But at a minimum, I think, the, I think there is you know, a hardship on the, on the first property, labeled number one anyway. <coughs> is there anyone that wants to make a motion? I'll give it a try. Um, I would move to disapprove the request for the variance based on no evidence of a hardship. I second. Okay, motion's been made and properly seconded. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify, vote by, signify by saying aye in favor. Aye. 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 Opposed? Opposed. Five, two. Okay. John Michael, or do we want to? Mr. Chairman, the next case to be presented to the board is 2016-191. This is a case that came to the okay. board previously. John Michael. Yes. Quick five minute break. The board will take a brief break and reconvene in about five minutes. His name is Teichtel, T-I-E-C-H-T-E-L. And I'm the rabbi and the executive director of the Center for Jewish Awareness. I'm here with Esther Teichtel, who is going to be one of the directors of our proposed daycare preschool. And I'm here with Sherry Lindsley, who's our consultant director, who's helping set up this preschool. We're in existence in this building. We moved in almost five years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have, um, the community has grown since we have been there. Um, a lot of members have, of the community, so, of all, of, so quickly, how many people are going to be there and yeah, why do you want to have a daycare? Very, very briefly, so we are proposing to start a preschool and um, we are, it's in an existing building and I'm going to ask Cherie who's consulting and setting up the preschool to tell you about the program. So the program will be designed to serve 28 children approximately in two classrooms. This is a beautiful new building. The classrooms are pre-existing, were designed for education purposes for the synagogue Sunday school program and summer camp, Wednesday night programs, things of that sort. So. Our intent is to utilize existing classroom space within this building to serve the community in yet another way. And that way is to provide the highest quality preschool setting for children from the surrounding area. Okay, tell us a little bit about your background and expertise in daycares or children. Absolutely. So my name is Cherie Lindsley, and I reside at 704 Glen Iris Court, and that's in the Bellevue community. 
I have over 30 years in the early childhood community. I have a master's degree in education. I teach early childhood education classes at Nashville State <laughs> Community College. I am the past president of the Tennessee Association for the Education of Young Children. In addition to consulting and training, I also serve as the director of the preschool at First Presbyterian in Franklin, Tennessee. Okay. So this is my life work and passion. Wonderful. Rabbi, anything else to add about your school and when would you hope to open if you have approval? We hope to open August 1st. If all goes well, I do just want to add one thing. Mm -hmm. I mentioned we had a community meeting and they asked how many children is, will you be having? Mm -hmm. We do. We were approved for two classrooms, each classroom 14 children, it's 28. We have the potential to add one more. So within the existing building, the most that we can have now is up to 42 students in the preschool. And you have plenty of parking? Plenty of parking. Okay. Any questions by board members? We appreciate you being here. Uh, we're going to close Thank the public you. hearing. Discussion or motion? Well, I'll move we approve the special exception. Uh, especially, you know, it, it got approval from the planning department, and we've had uh, two council members come and support it, and uh, it's, a, it's a great plan. So I, I will move that we approve the special exception. I'll second. Okay, motion's been made and properly seconded. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify, signify by saying aye. Uh, uh, opposed? Passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank Good luck. You. Thank you so much. Mr. Chairman, working our way back to case 2016-191, Nathan Nelson, the appellant on behalf of LD Hospitality, LLC, the owner of the property, for the property located at 2004 3rd Avenue North, just as you leave the Germantown area and head into the edge of uh, the Metro Center area. As you'll recall from prior presentation to this board a couple of meetings ago, the request is for a variance from first, parking requirements, two, landscape buffers, three, lot size in the MUGA district, all in order to construct a new hotel at the subject property shown here in aerial view. The site plan that had been submitted originally and the only one that we have in the packet at this point demonstrates the proposed location of the subject hotel, the layout of the parking arrangement, and other details accordingly. From my site visit in, I believe, early December, you see the subject property, presently vacant. The view across the street in the upper left-hand corner where another hotel is in fact proposed and going in as well. Then the views up and down that section of third in the upper left-hand corner as you move into the Metro Center area, and then uh, back down toward downtown in the lower right-hand corner. Is there anyone here in opposition to case number 2016-191? Seeing none. Uh, Mr. Chairman, the council member for district number two, DeCosta Hastings, is present now and wished to be recognized at the beginning of this presentation. Then we'll, of course, have the appellant make their desired presentation. Should note they'll have 15 or 10 minutes, rather, to make the presentation since there's no opposition present. Council Councilman Hastings, Hastings. Wait, welcome to the BZA and um, tell glad us about your opinion on this case. Yes, sir. Glad to be back with uh, and good to see all of you. Uh, this this is uh, a part of my my new home, uh, and also this project is actually one of my babies. I was the individual to found the uh, the property for the builder. I actually uh, went out to find a developer that we could work with, because of our district at one period of time was was not the place to be. Uh, but right now, everybody and their moms and cats and dogs <laughs> want to be where we are. But uh, actually, uh, Mr. Patel, which is the, the property owner, uh, actually um, had a really, really, really good plan. And uh, we saw that where the BZA, we're talking about buffers and all of that, that good stuff. I want to encourage you guys to know that this is a part of a plan that I, I directed and I'm looking forward to this, this development being something that is going to move our community in the right direction. Uh, on one side, as we know, is the highway. Uh, the other uh, side, as far as the entrance of this, this facility, is adjacent to another facility, which we know, which is uh, dealing with families and individuals from, from some uh, terrible things happening to them. Uh, the builders and the developers do understand that. I made it very, 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 very clear to them. Uh, and uh, we do understand that the property that they are building on is actually an old, old actually Metro Center was the dump at one period of time. Uh, so there are some challenges with building there as well. 
we want to get something really nice and uh, that's going to add to our, our community uh, because it has been a place to harbor uh, a lot of homeless and a lot of those things that have been, been there. Uh, we have other things that are there to be able to help them. It's helped a little bit with knocking down trees that are there, but we want to make sure the right type of development in biz business is there. The, uh, the actual owner and developers of the property have worked with me hand in hand. I don't know all the dimensions, but I do know on the side of the council and the planning aspect of this, I think this is a really, really good thing for us, and I, I hope and pray that uh, today that you guys will be able to to work with these guys to make sure that we get the right right things in place. And uh, that was my my will and my my last sermon. I have to go over to planning now. I have hearing over there, but I really appreciate you guys. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Councilman. Okay. And please identify yourself for the record, your address. Yes. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Nathan Melson. Uh, I am with uh, Site Engineering Consultants. We are the civil engineering consultant for the uh, for the owner on this project. Uh, previously, uh, at the during the December meeting, uh, I had we had requested uh, four variances: one for parking, two for uh, landscape for two separate landscape buffers and one for a build to zone. Now, uh, I have since submitted documents uh, that we are no longer requesting four variances. We have been able to achieve, meet the requirements for parking, as well as uh, shifted some of the site layout to uh, provide the buffer for the adjacent uh, sexual abuse center, which is the 10 foot buffer along the uh, western side of the site. Um, so tonight we're only requesting the a variance on the uh, build to zone and the uh, 30 foot landscape buffer, which is at the southwest corner of the side next to the main entrance um, in the bottom left hand corner uh, of the plan, as you can see. So as our agenda, I'm sorry to interrupt, our, our agenda says parking, but you said you, you were not asking for a parking variance. Yes, I, I tried, I had resubmitted a new letter stating that we are no longer <laughs> requesting those four uh, variances, but yeah. now we're just requesting two. John Michael, I have a question about that because what's on our agenda is different. So if he's saying something different, how do we handle that? Or can we proceed with him withdrawing something? Or if it's modified, does it have to be re-advertised? Probably don't need to re-advertise since it is a decrease in the ask, so to speak. They're asking for fewer things. If they were coming in saying not only are we asking for the original four variances, but also we're going to need something else, we would have to kick that out and re-advertise it. But since it's less, it's perfectly fine. It's effectively the same notice. Uh, perhaps good news to the board to have one less variance to have to contemplate. Yes, and we're not requesting like a change in a, the type of variance or anything like that. So. so remind us again what variances you were asking for and why. Uh, so we're asking for the variance on the build to zone, uh, which is the zero to 15 foot, because it's an MUGA zoning, there's a zero to 15 foot build to zone that the building needs to be built within along the frontage of the site. <laughs> and why can't you do that? Uh, we are to accommodate the number of parking, uh, but with that build to zone, there is an allowance within the code that a module of parking, which is a drive, a 24 foot drive aisle with two parking aisles or uh, two aisles of park, two rows of parking on either side of the drive aisle is allowed uh, between the frontage and the, uh, and the building facade. So, our request with regards to the build to zone is is in our mind that we or in our opinion that we are meeting the build to zone requirements with the exception of the uh, portion of the site that is in the bottom left hand corner with a little triangular piece where our main entrance drive okay. comes in. So and last time your client I asked question how many employees work there. I'll ask you that. How many employees are at this hotel? We had uh, when it, Whenever I, we were first talking about 15 employees, which for parking requirements, uh, there's 96 rooms planned for the building, 15 employees. So the minimum parking, or minimum parking requirement is 104 spaces. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, but there is also a reduction allowed in the code because the site uh, it abuts a public transit route uh, or a bus route. We are allowed a 10% reduction in parking, which drops us down to 94 spaces minimum, and we are meeting that requirement. That but is if you get the uh, footprint the where you want it. So I'm assuming if you didn't get the bill to zone, that what, would re restrict parking too, right? Well, we we can shift the the reason where the why the building is in the upper left hand corner as it is is that we we had the building previously located in the bottom right hand corner nearest uh, Interstate 65. To but in order to allow traffic flow, we would have to provide a uh, second entrance, which is nearest the uh, 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 the uh, bridge abutment, which reduces uh, side distances for vehicles leaving the site at that entrance. Pu Public Works did not allow that, and so they preferred us to have one entrance, which is at the intersection of Clay Street and Dominican. At the last hearing, your client said they had an arrangement with the neighboring property. Mm -hmm. and we got a letter from the neighboring property, mm -hmm. and it's the first time they heard about this project or even your client. Okay. How'd your client come to us and tell us something that was totally false? Uh, I'm, I'm unaware of that. Uh, he, I, it was, I was told that they, they had been in discussions, and so... Uh, and let me read you from the letter that we received from Tim Tolhill. Uh, most of our clients have experienced tr <coughs> tremendous trauma in their lives, and, be and being able to provide a facility that appears safe and consistent is critical for our ability to help these survivors heal. The idea of having a long-term arrangement where hotel patrons share parking would not provide the feeling of safety and consistency for our clients. Yes, and we are no longer re requesting any parking on any adjacent. All of our parking is on site. We meet all required parking on, like, on site and not requiring any parking for on Have the Have you adjacent. all met with your neighbor to tell them what your plans are or your new plans? Uh, I have not personally. Has anyone at the, this project done that? Uh, I am not aware of it at this time. That's pretty important. This is a significant national institution that helps people out. And they were very concerned that this was being proposed and they didn't know anything about it. Okay. And particularly that you all said that you had an agreement with them, which you did not. Mm -hmm. And it looks like the applicant is coming here to address that. So please identify yourself for the record to address and tell me how we had such a mix up in the last yep. week. Uh, my name is Cal Patel. Um, uh, 5, 520 Greenstone Lane, Mount Julia, Tennessee. Uh, Tim Tohill does know that a hotel is coming. We have had discussions about buying that back property. Okay. There's a difference of knowing and a hotel is coming, then your patrons are going to be using their land to park we, in. We did. We had discussion of that, too. We had discussion. We never came to an agreement. Who did but you discuss that with? With Tim Tohill. Okay. Did you tell him what you wanted to, who was going to park there? Yeah, we, well, that's what we were discussing. We were trying to negotiate, trying to buy that land out or lease it out. Finally, it came to when he went to when he took it to the board members. The board members said that they want, they might build something back there in the back. So, him knowing that you know, him saying that we did not have discussion of that, that's not accurate at all. He seems pretty unequivocal in his letter. This is not an arrangement that his group desires and the fact that we're very concerned how this parking situation will impact the survivors of sexual violence who come to our center. He, uh, well, uh, his, all the parking that he has is on the other side. It's off of French Landing. We're building on the other side. His employee parking okay. is on the side. I just want to know why you came to our meeting last time and said you had an arrangement with him. No, we were working on an arrangement. We were talking about buying that. It was all up to his board member. I never said that we came up with an arrangement, but that you, we agreed you on something. You implied to us that basically people could park next door. That we would work out something okay. with So let's them. talk about the rest of the variances. So you've reduced the parking one. Why do you need the front landscape buffer and the build a suit? The uh, 
the request for the uh, landscape buffer is for the bottom left hand side, 30 foot wide strip uh, along the bottom left hand corner uh, along at the main entrance. Um, the reason for the reason for that buffer is because an R6 zoning district abuts our property. Therefore, uh, that requires a minimum 30 foot buffer. Now that R6 zoning uh, is only for one parcel of land that is owned by the sexual abuse center uh, that was donated by the state to the abuse center and uh, there is also a 50 foot strip of public land between that one residential parcel and uh, our, our parcel. And therefore, I mean, we, we feel that that 30 foot buffer is excessive. I mean, we plan, it is our intention to dress up and plant landscaping and trees necessary to create a screen from the uh, uh, sexual abuse center of the hotel. And also but, in addition to helping with that screen is that we but are- But do you think the 30 foot buffer is excessive considering what your neighbor does and what their mission is? Well, it, can, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Oh, go ahead. I that, but I, I just wanted to make sure I understood what side, you, because it, it sounds like, I think the neighbor's on the 10 foot side, right? I mean, the, yeah, yes. I mean, it, other than the, the, at the very front part of the- If I may, uh, Stephen Kivett, Urban Forester, the 10 foot landscape buffer yard that they're showing is what's abutting the existing use, the sexual place. Mm -hmm. uh, the, six, the R6 remnant parcel is what's triggering the 30 foot landscape <laughs> buffer yard. And that's I'd, on the front? That's on the front left corner. It's a remnant parcel that is, will never be built on. So I didn't really have a problem with that going away as long as we're putting in the 10 foot landscape buffer along the west side of the property. Which we are. And okay. didn't you also indicate they'd have they'd be required to maintain the trees, the certain number of trees? Well, they'll still have to meet tree density. Yeah, that goes without saying. So they will have the required amount of trees on the parcel at the end of the day. Okay, continue. And, and so that those are the two variants. So the, so the thirty foot buffer, uh, we have uh, adjusted parking to allow for. Uh, now, it doesn't show it on this plan. Uh, that's why I wanted to have the updated plan, and I'm sorry that that is not in front of you right now. Um, but we have adjusted the parking to have a, a five-foot strip between the parking. So we can, if we're not allowed to plant within the public space, we do have some space to plant trees uh, that will provide screening and a buffer between the uh, sexual abuse center or, well, this corner of the property. And we, and we intend to uh, extend the buffer, which will you know, extend into the 10 foot buffer, which uh, is for the adjacent uh, sexual abuse center. Any questions for the applicant? So could you not reduce the size of the hotel a little bit and do away with some of these? <laughs> requirements zoning appeals uh, we have looked at reducing the size of the hotel and it will uh, uh, it, it will greatly impact the uh, functionality of the hotel uh, what does that mean uh, just the the, uh, the the profitability the, the meeting spaces the the uses of the hotel like the uh, that that is the Me issue. So, mm -hmm. how many meeting spaces are in this hotel? It's a it's a six bay meeting room space. Uh, f five or six? I think uh, I think it's right at uh, I think it's six six bay meeting room space, which can be close to about twelve hundred square foot. So, why are you still asking for ninety six rooms if you could ask for a smaller hotel? You wouldn't need some of these variances. What's your hardship that you're asking for this right now? Uh, well, the hardship is just that the it does not seem uh, seems unnecessary to have a 30 foot buffer with this R6 
district when that okay. it won't be used for. What about the other one? The the hardship is the uh, the irregular shape of the frontage. There will be some portion of the building just due to the zoning code and that we have to have 45 percent of our building facade along the frontage of the, of the property which we are meeting uh, but due to the curvature and irregular nature of the facade there will be a portion that will not be within that 15 foot or the the allowances given by the code with the module parking so it's the section of the property that is the little triangular piece at the entrance, the driveway entrance. Any other questions? Do you have anything else to add? No, sir. Okay. We're going to close the public hearing. Discussion? Well, I, I'm, I, I appreciate the applicant's work to get the variances down to two. And one of the things that I didn't understand uh, when they first came was the nature of the 30 foot variance and I didn't understand that there was this remnant small residential lot that is it looks like it's predominantly driveway now that's the city owned where the curb cut is and that's what's <laughs> driving the 30 foot buffer and I, I do appreciate the uh, recommendation from um, public works about having the one curb cut rather than forcing them to have another curb cut um, I very much applaud them not asking for a parking variance because I, in my notes, had a real tough time with that and had made a note that uh, it was not something that uh, I could accept. And so I, I appreciate that they're up to code there and not asking for anything uh, there. Um, and I think that the request for the um, bill to, uh, given the shape of the lot, uh, given the hard work that the you know council member has done to try to make this lot a buildable lot, uh, acknowledging from the council member that it was an odd shape lot that uh, that those two variance requests that are facing us now uh, are certainly reasonable and I think that uh, they've met the requirements of those two variances. I would like to thank our urban forester for his expertise on this and uh, explaining to us the difference of the two uh, buffers the 30 foot and the 10 foot. Um, you know, he's the expert on this, so I'm definitely deferring to him on that. So I don't have a objection to that. Well, and, and I would say point. too that the, the plan that we're seeing here is, I believe, not the site plan. It's the one that's in the, the packet. packet, the yep. new one, which shows uh, instead of that parking right at the property line, it does show an, an extra five foot buffer. So I really do think they've, uh, they heard us last time and addressed the landscape buffer needs that, that we talked about. Did, did we close the public clearing? Okay. We did. So you're not allowed to I was, speak. I just want to make a clarification, if that's okay. We'll allow it. What do you want? Uh, just the strip of land that's in the site plan that's on the screen where we have a call out where our main driveway comes in, that is public land. It is part of the public. There okay. on the other side is the residential parcel. Okay. Okay. Thank you. We'll close the public hearing again. Any more discussion about this? Anyone have a motion? I'll move that we approve the variance from uh, the landscape buffer and the bill to, it's not in our agenda, so I'm not sure exactly how to call it, um, because they've met all the requirements for those variances. Okay, motion's been made. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay, motion's been made properly second. Any more discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed? No. So it passes five to two. Next case, John Michael. Mr. Chairman, the next case is 2017-008. Greg Heckman is the appellant on this case. Steve North, current property of the property, owner of the property, located at 1215 Gallatin Pike in the Madison community. Shown here on the zoning map, this is a CL zoned property. The request before the board today is for four variances. First, for uh, variance from the required bypass lane. Second, for the materials involved in the construction of the front fence as required under 17.20. Uh, third, for uh, regarding the perimeter strip, perimeter buffer, and then finally for the, forgive the typo, masonry wall requirement on the north boundary line in this particular zoning district. 
The plan is for a construction of a new car wash at this location. Uh, it's been referred to the board under the uh, code section cited in your agenda. Uh, is there any opposition present for today's hearing? There is some, and as a result, the appellants will have 15 minutes to make the desired presentation to the board. Um, you will, of course, want to reserve some portion of your time for rebuttal if you plan to use any. And then we'll hear from the opponents as well. Mr. Chairman, the final photographs here basically show the uh, site as presently photographed just this week, actually, for the former law office there that Mr. North had for many years, two shots of the front of the property just from different angles, the view uh, up and down that section of Gallatin Pike to the left, and then the view straight across the street in the lower right-hand corner. Uh, Mr. Hagman, if you gentlemen will please introduce yourselves by name and address and make the desired presentation to the board. My name is David Watson, 1130 Hit Lane in Goodlesville. I'm the listing agent for this property. Mr. North asked me to come on his behalf to express support for this gentleman's appeal. My name is Jeremy Hall. I live at 109 Aaron's Crest Boulevard, Hermitage, Tennessee. <clears throat> I am um, the um, purchaser of the property and uh, would just, just coming in to ask for uh, a couple of the variances um, on the property, the first one being the, uh, the bypass lane. We've got it, um, let me open this real quick here. And while he's doing that, John Michael, could you tell us about why the bypass lane exists in the Metro Code and normally kind of which businesses have that? This is kind of like drive-through windows and bank tellers. That's the kind of the classic. It's where you've got cars having to navigate within the property other than just straight to a parking space. And those are great examples, drive-through windows at restaurants, so bank my, teller windows, and then here with a proposed car wash, obviously. My interpretation is that if you drive through a McDonald's or a bank and you're not going through the drive-through window under the Metro Code, you should be allowed to go all the way around the building and exit without being stuck behind the drive-through window traffic. Is that correct? So people that don't provide a clear access to the all the way around the building need a variance. Okay, continue. So it's so, on the property, it's not off the property. No, it's on the property. Got so it. you have to provide a lane that is totally yeah. around the building mm -hmm. leaving um, for these kind of businesses. Yeah, it sounded like something that was off the property, so that's a good clarification. So like I said, when you go to a bank, you know, if you're going around the bank, you don't want to be blocked behind a bunch of drive through windows. You want to be able to go all the way around and leave. Same thing for a fast food restaurant. So, continue. All right, so, so the reason in our, our bypass lane, a lot of our customers that, that, that pull in, we're a gated, uh, gated property. You can't pull in the exit on behalf of the free vacuums. You've got to get a car wash to, to, um, to vacuum the vehicle. So after a customer is, um, is, is through the entrance gates, they, they've paid and decide they want to refund or want to leave or whatnot. That's the reason why we put this bypass lane so close to the entrance of our building is where our staff is working and standing. And that way they don't have to back up on oncoming traffic and try to get in the exit gate to get to the front office or lobby area to ask the, um, employee for a, for a refund or if they were coming in to buy a gift card or whatnot. Um, that's the reason why I've asked for the, um, the the variance on this one. This will be the 16th car wash that I've built. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with Super Speed Wash. It's one of the owners, operators of that. Uh, we built 12 of those and just recently, well, about two years ago. So, to, uh, so you're still asking for how many variances? Uh, there was... A total of three. Is it three or four? It's just four here. Oh, okay, four. I'm sorry. Okay, so you've been in the car wash business. Why do you need four variances? Why can't you do this with one or two or none? Well, the bypass is, um, out of all of the washes that I've built, I've never been asked for a bypass lane <clears throat> to go either all the way around my property or um, to, to, I guess, the, the comments that I got back was they didn't want a car to have to be have to wait to get to the bypass lane. Yeah, that's that's the point. Like I said, if you were at a fast food restaurant, right. you don't want to have to wait behind the people that are ordering their food or getting their food to exit from that part of the building. Right, right. That's what Metro Code says. So why can't you do that on this particular lot? Well, out of the, um, uh, on this particular lot, it, it wouldn't allow for the, uh, the, um, the access to go all the way around the back of the property. But it looks like a pretty big lot. So 
how, how does that work that you're not well, it's, able to? it's a little bit under an acre, and we're um, ate up by quite a bit of it, excepting the uh, eight-foot sidewalks and landscape buffer they <laughs> want, um, and along with the uh, adding of the curb and gutter along Gallatin Road. Sure. Um, which the adding of the curb and gutter, the eight-foot sidewalk, and then also the grass strip plus the landscape and buffer that we're, you know, not asking for a variance on has ate up quite a bit of the property to not allow for that bypass lane. Okay. What about the other variances? Uh, the other one, <clears throat> a big portion of our business is um, on um, impulse. And it's on what? Impulse. Like, In you know, people driving by just don't really plan to go to a car wash. Oh, see, you pull in. Okay. Yeah. They, um, they see a car wash, they pull in and say, hey, I could use that. Right, right. So the um, the masonry wall, two two and a half foot masonry knee high wall they call to uh, go in front of the property along um, Gallatin Road. Um, what, what, what I've had happen in the past is <clears throat> farther down the road in East Nashville, I uh, built a super speed wash there close to Trinity Lane, and we did the, the two and a half foot masonry wall there. We've, um, we've had a lot of graffiti on it. So we're out there constantly cleaning that. I like the wall idea, but what I would like to do is the um, masonry pillars with like a wrought iron in between um, or a, an aluminum gate just to kind of cut down uh, um, on the graffiti that could happen and then also um, um, open up the visibility of, of my location a little bit more. But the wall is supposed to use as a screen. You heard us talk about the buffer in the last case. I mean, sometimes these walls screen mm -hmm. certain activities, maybe like a car wash. So what's and, the and hardship I'm fine, about I mean, I'm, I'm fine with the wall. The, the biggest thing I had is the previous, uh, when I had the car wash down closer to Trina Lane there on, um, on Gallatin Road, um, it was graffiti quite a bit. So we were constantly cleaning that just to kind of keep it attractive. Um, I'm fine with the wall and I don't have any problem because I've done it before, but okay. just what trying to eliminate some of the gravity. What about the other two hardships? Um, the other one is the, uh, the wall on the, the north side of the property, which um, is, is behind, I guess, the, um, my, behind my car wash here. It wants a, um, a six-foot masonry wall from the, the front of the property all the way to the back of the property. <clears throat> With where my building is, my building is um, um, 80 foot long, and then I've got a 30 foot canopy there, so that's a good portion of it. Um, with with where I've got it pushed up to the the um, the north side of the property, I put my um, reclaim tanks. We reclaim about 75 percent of our water that we use. Uh, my reclaim tanks normally go in the back of the uh, the building there, which would cause um, cause me to have to move my um, car wash out a little bit in order to obtain that. Um, What's wrong with that? Um, it, it cuts down on this uh, the grass area over here is where we're proposing to put the, uh, the retention, um, the water quality and retention area. Okay. And you're asking for, the, what's the fourth variance you're asking for? Uh, I wasn't aware of a fourth one. Is there four or three? Four. There four, yes. Maybe so it's another wall. Bypass well, there's, there's, two, there's two on Gallatin. I think he's, he's proposing the same solution for two of the variants. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, the, the one down Gallatin Road, and which continues all the way down Berkeley, is the um, where, where I'm proposing to do the masonry um, pillars with the, with the right iron in between versus the complete masonry wall. Okay. And Mr. Chairman, as you recall, you had the urban forester here who is, of course, capable of speaking to the perimeter landscape um, yes. requirement that's in play there in case there's a question from the board on that. Let's ask our expert, the uh, forester, the, why the, this is in the code. And well, the two and a half foot wall around the perimeter is coming out of the permitted with conditions section, as is the six foot solid wall on the north property line. That's where the, all that's coming from. It's permitted with conditions triggered by the use of a car wash. So in the code specifically, mm -hmm. car washes have this rule, not they have fast screening, food restaurants. They have screening rules, yes. It's very specific to car washes. And why do car washes have those rules when other businesses don't? Probably from the spray, I'm guessing. Okay. A and solid wall. I, as opposed to something visual, it's probably a spray thing. Mm -hmm. uh, anything with noise or right. anything light or anything like that. 
I've got I've got pictures here if y'all like to see them. The the car wash we just opened in Dixon. This is a I Is it the same one. kind of car wash? Yes, sir. Okay. Mm -hmm. But the, the the six foot wall on the north, the perimeter on the west and the south, which includes not only the the uh, strip of landscaping, but also the two and a half foot wall, and then on the east would be a buffer due to a zone classification change, and that's an A buffer. It's one of the minimal ones, but that would be required on that property line. So tell us the difference between an A buffer and B and C and all that. A is the least intense. It's just it's for a minor zone change. So a what D, kind of things do you have to do for an A buffer? What's uh, well, all of them include canopy trees, understory trees, and shrubs. Mm -hmm. It's just the numbers and the width that is okay. required. A is very minimal, smallest width, fewest plants. Mm -hmm. A D would be something it would be like industrial up against residential. Okay. Very intense, lots of plants, very wide. In fact, the widest one, I think, is 50 feet. Okay. Hardly ever gets used. Thank you. Have, uh, have you spoken with Councilman Davis about this? We have a letter in him, from him from the previous... Uh, oh, no, wait. This is for... Sorry, I was misreading this. He is asking that we defer this for uh, till February 2nd. Uh, have, you, have you spoken with Councilman Davis I, about this? I, I did speak with him. Um, I spoke with him, I think, later part of last week. Um, he returned my phone call, and the, um, he had made no um, no ask of that. He said that he appreciated me deferring the first one to give him time and uh, to, to meet with his community. And I told him I was more than willing, you know, to do that, and I did that. And I told him I'd also be more willing to meet with him. And so you, you've... You've met with some community people? No, sir, I'm oh, not. You have, okay. Yeah, he I'm said sorry, I was, I was confused on that. It, it, it is, so, the letter's dated January 3rd, so I'm assuming it was meant for the last meeting, but. Uh, yeah, see, we, I, I believe our first meeting was um, January the 5th. Right. And uh, he, he asked me to defer that to this meeting two weeks. Um, so it would allow him time to meet with the community. And also, um, you know, it generated so much press that, um, you know, the Patton and, uh, I mean, the old general and Elvis Presley, you know, was managed out of that house. Right. Um, you know, to, to give somebody time to uh, to come up with the money and buy it to do with what they want. And I told him that there's a price. Yeah, I mean, I, I would sell it. But within that two weeks, nobody came and made an offer. So. Okay. We have a letter from uh, Jerry and Jane Armour, who live in Madison. And in reference to the masonry wall, they point out the nearby masonry walls that are long along Gallatin Pike of the Spring Hill and National Cemeteries. Are you familiar with those properties near Briley Parkway? Yes. So they obviously have these long walls, just very stately. I mean, I know the National Cemetery was built right after the, or during the Civil War period. Um, isn't there, you don't have any need to, uh, follow the code with that strong of a wall and that well, kind of look? Yeah, that, say something. I'd like to point out that the cemetery is not advertising for customers. This gentleman would like people to come into his property. And, and You're saying they have a built-in customer base? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and the, uh, the, uh, the walls across the, um, in, in front of the cemetery, they're, uh, they're like a stacked stone, just a, a rock, mm -hmm. um, which, you know, that's something that, um, um, you know, we probably wouldn't, wouldn't carry that through. We'd probably do a... Um, so the, block or, um, the pictures that you passed around, there seemed to be some sort of tower, and it said car wash or wash and roll. Is that the name of your? That's the name of my company. Okay, yes. so doesn't that attract people, this big, almost a story and a half sign that says this is a car wash? Oh, it, it does. Uh, I just said, you know, a, a lot of our, um, and, and I'm fine with the masonry wall. I just preferably think that but I've been out there scrubbing and high pressure and off graffiti in the past. And that area there is not too far from the other area that I have in East Nashville. I assume the same thing could happen. Um, you know, and it just, I think personally, wrought iron or, um, you know, aluminum look um, a little bit better. And to the, uh, the spray of the car wash, my, my car wash isn't an open bay car wash. It's all contained inside that 80 foot building. So there's, there's nothing leaving that building. <clears throat> okay. So you already own the building? 
I'm sorry. No, no, sir. It's we've got it under contract. You have an option. No, he has oh, a contract so. to purchase. Okay. I'm contract is, it, to purchase is that contract pending based on what this board may or may not do? He has a due diligence period. He hasn't exercised the. Okay. Uh, it hasn't closed yet. Okay. Has you been contacted by historical? No, sir. I'm not. I thought that's what the councilman was asking for a delay for. If I could clarify, Mr. Chairman, on that particular point, though the property is not uh, directly under the bailiwick of our historical commission, I think lowercase, lowercase h, historic interest in the property has been a source of community concern and subsequent concern of the district council member and even the neighboring district council member. So um, historic doesn't have a bite at this one directly in terms of the zoning variances. Yeah. Okay. May I speak to that? Sure, of course. Uh, Mr. North has had the property for sale for over four years. I think I am, I think, the third broker who's had this property for sale. Uh, I've listed it in the Wall Street Journal. You listed in the Wall Street Journal? I really? did. Yeah. I've tried very hard to sell this property. I've made uh, tremendous use of uh, Colonel Tom Parker and Elvis Presley uh, to try and motivate someone to purchase this property with a historical uh, interest. Uh, Mr. North would prefer the property were preserved, but no one has come forth with money to purchase the property in spite of all of our many and diligent efforts. The historic people put us on their watch list a couple of years ago. Uh, we've been on TV, we've been on national media, uh, AP carried the story around the country, but no one has come forth with any money except these people. Mm -hmm. Mr. North has retired. He needs to sell his property, and this is the only buyer we've been able to secure, and we have a binding contract with this gentleman to purchase the property. When all of this um, half-truth media attention came out recently, we were uh, bombarded with people, and we've even received uh, a letter of intent, but it has uh, three due diligence periods in it, and it has as much chance of happening as, well, anyway. Uh, this man has come forward, he's put his money on the line, and he's willing to purchase the property and relieve Mr. North of the obligation of continuing to own it. Okay. Anything else to add? No, sir. So the way this works, uh, we're going to hear from the opposition, and okay. then you'll have 12 minutes I, of... I, I have a question. Yeah, okay. Thanks. Sure. Cool. Okay. Um, so I'm reading parking required... Can one of you verify? There's a couple numbers here. To me, it looks like six spaces are required. Okay, and then you're providing 20? 22. 22. Mm -hmm. um, so if you didn't provide all that parking, could you provide the bypass lane? Uh, I mean, we could try it. I don't believe so because the parking is in line with the building here. So by eliminating some of the parking um, and... and the biggest thing to, to route around the building would be to build, move the building to the south, mm -hmm. which would eliminate the spacing between the parking that, you know, are allowed for a drive lane, <clears throat> and then encroach in the, uh, the green space that we're adding to the property now. Do they have your drawing here? Hmm? Yes. Okay. Uh, I, I'm not sure what the definition of a bypass lane is, but could that not be considered a bypass lane that allows you yes. to, to bypass going through the car wash and exit again? It doesn't go all the way around the building, but it, it does relieve you from the obligation of going through the car wash. And that's... Um, so you're using that... You're saying the diversion right before you go into the car wash, you turn to your left if you change your mind or whatever. That's correct. Correct, yeah. And that, that's like not said, a that's true that's bypass lane. That's, this, is the, um, this is the bypass lane that we've done. Yeah, we had five of them in, in Davidson County, and this is the first time that I've ever, I've ever heard of this. Um, so that's not, but that wouldn't, just being able to turn left when you immediately enter is not a true bypass lane. But that's what I'm saying. This is, that's, uh, I understand what you're saying. But John just, Michaels, do you have any? Yes. So he's asking, there's the entrance with the two arrows. If you could just hang a left, does that take care of the bypass lane requirement? No, I'm sorry, David. We might not be talking about the same thing. After you go through the gates, like you yes. were three are, and, mm -hmm. and there's cars queuing right there, there's a place to turn left. 
before you go into the actual car wash oh, well, structure no, itself. I think because you're backing up and you're behind right. cars that you're blocked. Right. So I, you could be potentially. I just blocked. wanted to make sure we were talking about the same yeah. thing. Right. So potentially you could be behind cars waiting and not being able to get out. That's what I'm saying. The reason why we put the bypass lane like that is to get the customer closer to the staff um, versus coming in on traffic coming out. To, you know, um, it, it lessens the chance of accidents happening. Like I said, this is the fifth one that we would have done in Davidson County that has ever been asked to, to do a bypass lane that completely goes a, around the property. <clears throat> Any other questions? Have you spoken to any other metro agencies about your site plan? A lot of people go to different metro agencies and discuss their, the plans, or are you just coming to us first? No, we, we um, um, Greg Heckman, my, my civil engineer, he, he sent them over to, uh, to planning, and that was one of the comments that, that they said they would like to see as a bypass lane without being in stack, without, without the customer having to be in stack, so I just went ahead and asked for a variance to, you know, kind of tell the reason why we do the bypass lane there. Any other questions? Okay, we're gonna hear from the opposition. You come back after the opposition with 12 minutes and 48 seconds. Let's hear from the opposition. Please identify yourself and your address for the record. I'm Robbie Jones, 804 Canton Pass, C-A-N-T-O-N in Madison, Tennessee. And I'm here to represent Historic Nashville, a nonprofit based in the city. First of all, Kate Hamilton, the executive director of Discover Madison and Emquay Station Visitor Center, has a written position statement um, that she wanted to submit on behalf of her board of directors. They're actually meeting right now is why she couldn't attend. Okay. It's an opposition to the uh, project. She mm -hmm. wanted me, I only have one copy, I apologize. Okay, well, we'll take that as part of the record. She wanted me to have that filed as part of the record. Um, Historic Nashville is opposed to these variances because we don't feel like there's a hardship um, with this project proposal. The, the owners uh, have already made our argument for us that Mr. North has advertised this property for sale for four years as a historic landmark. So the owner knew going into it that it was a historic landmark with lots of community uh, value and that it had some limitations with the, with the property's uh, siting for his proposed project. So we believe that going into that, um, the hardship argument is hard for us to uh, buy into. Um, we also have worked with Mr. North for a couple of years. As you know, the property is eligible for the National Register of Historic Places as a music industry landmark. Metro Historical Commission would have the ability to do a 90-day delay on a demolition permit when and if that ever is pulled, but that is really their only purview in this in this scenario. Um, but. We have worked with Mr. North. We listed it on our endangered property list in 2015. We've advocated for its preservation. We have, I've worked behind the scenes endlessly on this particular project because I live in Madison and I love the neighborhood and I love this, this property. We worked with uh, television shows, uh, Nashville Flipped was interested in it and uh, Mike Wolf is on our board, he pursued it. Uh, we've worked with Louise Burton, she came and toured with Mr. North and I last weekend. Her husband's James Burton who's Elvis Presley's guitar player. They live in Shreveport, Louisiana. Their son lives here in Nashville. They want to do whatever they can to facilitate someone buying the property um, and we have other other interested investors who are interested but what the roadblock has been mr. North is has now has a contract on the property with the applicant and we've been told that there's nothing that anyone can do that this this project's moving forward unless we're able to negotiate a deal where the uh, the buyers could buy it directly from the applicant and bypass Mr. North, which we're willing to do. And we have people with resources to do that. Um, we have, just need some more time. Have you made him an offer? It sounded like he was. With the offer we've been told, it's $250,000 more than they paid for it. And we would like to negotiate with them. It would go from 550 to 790, where we understand that they need to get their re, re, uh, compensated for money spent on engineering plans and application fees and times and all that. But we're, we're hoping that we could negotiate with them and meet in the middle. And we have people who are willing to do that. We just need time to sit down at the table and make these offers. So let's get back to the hardship. So why are you objecting to them not having a turnaround lane at this property? We believe that 
this this building is an asset. I know this is not the proper venue that we're we're, we're reviewing variances here. Yeah. But you guys represent the city of Nashville. If you approve these variances, you're saying the city of Nashville feels like a car wash is the best use of this property and not this historic landmark, and that it's okay for it to be demolished. And we we are opposed to that adamantly. Um, at, we're the ones who got the AP article that went international. We're the ones who got the TV attention. We're we're really advocating. We're not trying to be. Um, we can't go out and write checks for these properties. If we did, we would. If we had the money, I'd go out and buy properties all over town and we'd save them one by one. But we can't. We have to react to the situation at hand. And this is our situation at hand. We have worked hard and we found some investors who are willing to sit down with the owners and buy the property. We have Nancy Van Rees and Anthony Davis, who are the council members for that for that area, who are, would be more than willing, I would think, to sit down and find vacant properties elsewhere on Gallatin Road in Madison. There are several. I commute to work and back every day and I see them, that would be proper places for car washes and there would be no community opposition whatsoever. They may not even need variances. We would just make that happen. And that's what we would love to see in the end of the day with this particular project. But if you approve the variances, you're making it easier for them to tear this building down and build a car wash. And you're saying that that's what the city of Nashville feels is the best thing for this property. And we disagree with that and would ask you guys to, to, to deny the variances and, and let us have some more time to come up with a better solution to this situation so that the building can be preserved. Okay. Questions of the opposition? Thank you for being here. Thanks for coming out today. Appreciate it. Thank you Let's hear from the applicant again. Yes. Rebuttal. So, first of all, the gentleman from Historic was very articulate. Unfortunately, nothing he said had anything to do with what we're here for today. Period. Uh, the property is permitted for the car wash use. That's not a question. Uh, show me the money. Uh, when this gentleman uh, told me they would be willing to resell the property instead of build a car wash, I passed that uh, information on to Mr. North. Uh, we have passed it on to every buyer that we've had information with, uh, a, co a conversation with, and no one's come forth with money. Uh, I know Kate, uh, and um, philosophically, she disagrees with what we're doing, but uh, she also knows Mr. North and knows this is something he needs to do. And the value of the property uh, as uh, Colonel Parker's residence has been greatly diminished by the Elvis Presley estate. You cannot make money off of this property using Elvis Presley's name or using Colonel Tom Parker's name. It's an old house sitting on a really valuable corner lot, but the house has no value because of the Elvis Presley estate. We have contacted them directly to try and sell them the property. They have no interest in it. You know, I'm, I'm not trying to put a, um, a, a very cheap car wash here. I do a very, very nice car wash would, would um, I, I think in, enhance the area of that. Um, of that area, you know, it start a um, you know revitalization over there. Um, seeing somebody you know come in and dump some serious money. I mean, most of our projects are 2.2 to 2.6 million dollars. I mean, we don't cut any corners. It's all masonry. It's you know it's, it's a very nice building. And um, like I said, that, that that site there has been on the market for a long time. I've just chose other sites to build. Is why I'm just now getting to this site. <clears throat> How many employees would you have at this location? Um, I'll have normally two to four. Um, our hours of operation in the winter are eight to six, and in the um, summer months are eight to eight. Um, well, tell me again the hardships. Hardship one, um, the, the first one was on the bypass lane. Um, I've got a bypass lane, but I don't have a bypass lane that you can pass the, uh, the cars that are in queue. Then you don't have a bypass lane. Okay. Um, Okay, so I'd, I'd the, the code requires barriers. the bypass lane go all the way around the building. So I didn't know that it said all the way around. I John Michael, what does our bypass laws require? I mean, if it didn't, you wouldn't be here with that variance for a bypass lane. So obviously, what you proposed is not what the code requires. Mr. Bill Chairman, I think the operative language from 172070, which has to do with queuing requirements for drive-through facilities, is the 
I guess, next to last full sentence, each land use in Table 1712-070, which does, include, of course, include car wash full service, shall have a bypass lane with a minimum width of 12 feet and shall be clearly distinguished from the queuing lane by markings. Um, ultimately, staff in its review of the application determined that this was not a bypass lane. The board has an opportunity to, I guess, reinterpret that if you see fit, but that was where staff came down. So would, Could you not would the by bypass. bypass lane also have to bypass the, the gates where you pay right after you turn in? This is Does anybody know? I, I didn't hear the question. I'm sorry. Well, I'm, I'm, I don't know that you would know the answer, or if anybody does, but um, if the bypass lane has to bypass everything, it seems like oh, I'm asking if it has to bypass the actual gates that you go through. That's where you pay, I'm assuming, those, That's correct. those three lanes there. And so are you in Michael read the, it talked about a clear 12 foot wide lane dedicated. Yeah, the most direct answer is that the code does not specify an answer to the question that Mr. Harper posed. So are you have other car washes? Uh, yes, ma'am. How many did you say? Um, 16. And are they located in Davidson County? Five of them. And do those five have a bypass lane? It's got this, this, this footprint here. It's got the same plan you've got there. Correct. Has it ever been told to you that they needed a bypass lane? Did you build those locations? I did. And just as, um, uh, you know, a competitor of mine in, um, in Nashville over <clears throat> off of Dickerson Road, the Camel Express, in front of Lowe's and Walmart there, has got this, you know, what's I call a bypass lane, but it evidently is not a bypass lane, exactly like this, after the gates. Um, there's not a car wash in Davidson County that's got a true dedicated bypass lane around the whole, the, the whole property. Any other questions? Do you all have anything else to add? Is this bypass lane in Gallatin Road? That's what I can figure out from this plan. I'm sorry? Is this bypass lane into Gallatin Road? Um, no, sir, my, my bypass, or what I've got dedicated for a bypass lane is on my property. Um, I guess the bypass lane that code reads would, would come in off of Berkeley, go um, as far north as the property line, up to Gallatin Road, back west, I mean back south on the property line, out to um, the, the, the top, the corner of Berkeley and Gallatin Road. This, with that bypass lane that you show here, has it been approved by traffic? I mean, there's a apartment house for retired people right down in Berkeley. I'm wondering if they're going to interfere with that. Well, the bypass lane that I've got here, it, it doesn't interfere with anything off off of my site. So if if you had to to rework this, uh, and I'm assuming what I'm going to say would work as a bypass lane. I don't know for sure. But if you hypothetically, instead of having three gates, if you only had two gates and the gate that was farthest to the right uh, was the beginning of your bypass lane and you shifted the pavement a little bit so that you would have a bypass lane that uh, essentially followed the outside of the property. But then you get stuck in the queue on the other side as the cars exit Well, I, the I'm saying if the, if the bypass went past the car wash and then emptied on the Gallatin Road. That would serve the purpose of being able to bypass, because everything else on the property is what you're, that's the, the gig that you're paying for. You're paying for the, the car wash, the car wash, which is the building, then you come out of the building and you have all those parking bays are there for detailing, not for right. parking while you go inside to do business. That is part of the business. So there's really no need to keep going on that part of the property. You're not going to the dumpster. You're not doing anything else. You're just bypassing the whole operation, you said, oh, I don't want to pay for this. It's 50 cents more than I expected, so I'm going to go out and it dumps you on the Gallatin Road. It seems to me that if you could make that fit in the property, then you would have a bypass lane. And I can do that, and um, I, I know that development on Gallatin Road, um, a lot of um, planning and code members, they, they get excited about, you know, limiting the ingress-egress on Gallatin Road, so I've closed that down. <coughs> 
<laughs> and just utilizing the one on secondary street to right close, and, you know and if you're following what i'm saying you're you would essentially still be using the one curb cut that is on there but you would be using it for egress not ingress uh, if that you know maybe you can make it right turn only or something out of the property on the gallatin correct but that that would i i think as i understand it that would take take care of the bypass lane issue i've got a question would it alleviate the bypass question if his um, gates that come in if say the one all the way to the left were designated a bypass lane so that you could go right in through that gate and turn right back around without getting in the queue and leave the property you mean just that quick little turn into the that's left? That's correct. That's mm -hmm. not a bypass lane. Well, like I could eliminate this. Remember what it, John Michael? Can you, you John no, Michael? Can you read that to me again about the 12 feet? Bypass lane with a minimum width of 12 feet and shall be clearly distinguished from the queuing lane by markings. Right. So we could absolutely do that. I could take this grass strip out, <clears throat> make the left lane a bypass lane so when they come in they can just do a quick u-turn and not even hit the queuing area a u-turn so they could get out easily by taking a u-turn that would fall yes. under the the justification of a bypass lane i'm not a planner but that would be for someone else to determine if that was truly a bypass lane because we could you know mark it as a bypass lane who, be 12 foot wide who makes that determination at codes whether they've met the bypass lane or not So, plans reviewers are going to look at any commercial development like this, but the beginning point is the zoning examiner looking to see if it meets the base zoning criteria, such as this one. So, as this appears to be one that uh, one of our senior examiners got his hands on when they came in, he'd probably be the same guy to review it a second time if there was any alteration of the site plan. So, so in theory, if if, if we deferred it, the he could revise his plan, take it through, and an examiner would determine whether or not he had a bypass lane or not, and at that point, he would or would not need to ask for that part of the variance. Sure, and that would save him from having lane. to engineer a formal, any, any big, huge overall site plan necessarily just to come through and check that in advance so that before they come back to the board, they'll kind of know where staff has come down on that issue. So so in theory, we, uh, we could defer the whole thing or we could vote on the other three things and defer that, and either it has to has to be accepted by you guys, or you have to come back and ask for You're correct that you could choose either path. You could vote on some number of the variance requests today and then defer some other component. We've done that recently on the property at 1234 Antioch Pike, uh, settling two of the questions initially and then bringing back the sidewalk variance request at a later date. Or you could just punt the whole thing if you saw fit. You have those options. So getting back to we were going through the hardships for each of the four. So you told us about perimeter, no, you told us about the front fence, you're trying to propose something different that's permitted with conditions, I thought I heard the urban forester say. The, the requirement comes out of the permitted with conditions section, okay. as opposed to the 1724, which is more or less thought of as the tree ordinance. Do you, can I ask you if you feel it's, if, if it's allowed, the different front fence? That's not for me to say. Okay. Um, and then the third is a perimeter buffer, which is, I'm having trouble understanding what the, the zone examiner wrote. <laughs> after perimeter, there should have been a comma. There's a landscape perimeter strip required on the west and the south side where you have frontage on right-of-way and then there's a buffer request on the east side of the property which is up against a different zone district and it looks like on the east they're proposing a 10-foot buffer yard is that right the 10-foot buffer yard on the east with a uh, well it's a buffer a so it's 15 mm -hmm. 10 or 5 mm -hmm. but the 5 includes an opaque fence you have choices there. So what well, are you actually asking, proposing? On, on the east side, on I'm east? not asking for any. I'm, I'm, okay. very, I'm very fine with that one. On the north side of the property, it's, uh, 
in the code is asking for a six foot high masonry wall on the north side that's behind the building. My building takes up a good portion of that property, which is, you know, uh, you know, taller than a six foot wall, well, but. There's also another, the property adjoining that has about a 12 foot hill. Yeah. I mean, uh, th there's a, a dirt barrier at that point. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure I understand the reason for well a wall that would I think the, the original reason for the wall was for the old style car washes right. where you drove in you spray and you drive out right that has spray that was that's what was triggering the wall in the ordinance the, wa the ordinance did not differentiate between that type of car wash and this type of and, car and wash. these these ordinances never really contemplate the physical condition of the property next to I mean, obviously they couldn't foresee that there's they wouldn't say you got to have a mission wall unless there's a nice dirt hill there or you know sure so you know i don't i don't know if the board will go along with this but my thinking is if if we voted on the on the gallatin and the berkeley drive those two issues and deferred but because i think that no matter how the board votes that that's not going to stop you from doing the project there i think they're more maintenance preferences and management preferences not physical limitations. But if we deferred on the the bypass lane and and the uh, the north property wall because I could see potentially there being some physical issues there and if you could come back and better address you might have a different hardship or you know we can do the lane but we can't do the wall or what if we did this wall because of that or whatever because things are things are moving around and I you know Whenever somebody brings you plan A and B, you hate to vote on plan C if no one's seen it. Sure. So I think that would give you a chance to come back and address those issues specifically. And That's assuming the board went along with it. And I'm fine with the wall on the north side. I just, it's, it's another big mark for gra graffiti. And I know in an area like that, like I said, I've, I've, I've fought it since I've, I've got the one in East Nashville. And it's just a big old wall. And my building is, is covering up, you know, the majority of it. The adjacent business is the um, automotive, you know, in the automotive. And, and I get that. And yeah. The, the, the problem is with, with a lot of things like this, we're, you know, we, we legally have to find a hardship and unfortunately a maintenance nightmare, while in, in your reality is a hardship, but as far as the code goes, it really isn't a hardship. So I'm not saying that we wouldn't vote to give you the, I don't know how everybody's going to vote, but I, I think that that might be the most fair way to go, in my opinion, given the totality of the things you're asking for. It's the, vote on two of them and defer on two of them because with the hope that the other two could either be resolved or you accept it and hey I'm here's my solution and you might not have to come back I don't know how's, how's the board feel about that? I guess we're still open public meeting but. they're asking for four variances so I would have to be explained four hardships okay. yeah. and, and I'm not so should we close the public hearing before we all this? Yes, well do you have anything else to say before we close the public hearing yes, sir. Okay, thank you. We're gonna close the public hearing. Discussion, so it's been proposed that we defer a couple of these experiences and vote on a couple. What's our thoughts? Well, I, I, I mean, I, I'm happy personally to vote on all of them because I don't see a hardship. And I think that there's, you know, I, I appreciate what they're trying to do. It looks like a really nice business. Um, I'm sure the others are, uh, you know, really nice car washes, but I see a lot of choices in the model that create the hardship. I mean, it's the, the amount of parking spaces that mm -hmm. you have. It's some of these other choices that that are creating the hardship. I mean, I, I am empathetic to the fence, um, but I'm not sure exactly what the hardship is, although I think that, you know, the front little short fence with some wrought iron, I think that'd be a prettier fence. Uh, for the neighborhood and and it makes sense and i get i get that and i'm empathetic to it but you know i i think four variances for a piece of property that is large and square there's something about it that just says it's just not right and well I'm, and i know we separate the historical aspect of it um well the historic you know, that's, aspect that's, a, of that's it. another piece but we're here to discuss the variances but i think well that's what i said i'm that that, that i'm again empathetic to that piece but looking at it uh, just from, a, you know, what are the hardships? Um, I, well, and I, 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 don't, I, would, I would be much 
if, if he had council support, if he had others to say, hey, man, we really want this, and and yet I understand from the seller um, the, the, the trouble, uh, but like I said, I just, I don't, I, I see a lot of choices, and I see those choices in being the cause of the hearts of, of the request. So does anyone want to make a motion? I'd like to have a little more discussion if we could, because okay. it seems to me a lot of time, I don't like deferring part or all, because I feel like we double hear these cases a lot and we have got to get the business of this county done. Uh, <laughs> at the same time, we have a owner of this property who wants to sell it. He's got a buyer. The buyer is a business owner who has five similar businesses in the county and has not had the requirement of this bypass lane. And I'm only going to talk about the bypass lane. I would tend to think, and I feel like he's willing to do the bypass lane, but it's gonna, he's going to have to move some things around to do it. My thought would be defer to let him do the bypass lane if he wants to do that. And as far as the walls, he can, I think he needs to comply. There's not a hardship on the walls. Like many people that come before us, he's just saying from his experience, I think certain things are better than others. And as we all know, and as uh, our forester has told us, some of the requirements no longer apply because we have a new kind of car wash that didn't exist at that time. So uh, for purposes of contributing to everybody's thoughts, I would like to see the bypass lane variance deferred and the other three, we could vote on the other three and that's his decision on how he wants to proceed. But I don't think we need additional proof on the bypass lane. Either he's able to do it or he's not. So if he's able to do it, then he won't have to come back here. I don't think he should. It's a permitted use right. of the property. Uh, right. Well, the reason, if I may, that I'm suggesting we defer on the bypass, it, it seems to me that, first of all, there is confusion, because, on, at least on his part, that he's done this before. Sure. And that's that in and of itself is an excuse. So, oh, this is the first time you've been called. You still have to do it. I get that. But I think even among this board and in the staff, there's not real clarity to what defines like how how much bypassing is to be done. You know, can it go out on Gallatin Road, which to me makes sense, yeah. but that might not meet the letter. And I'm saying let's put it on the, the reviewer. He, he had to say no because there is no bypass. But right. with this, you know, and then it doesn't come back and it's fine, the business is done. And and I didn't I didn't mean my suggestion to defer this is you know, I, I don't think there's a hardship for, for any of that. I just think there is confusion on the bypass, which is the only reason I'm suggesting we defer on that. I've been on this board a number of years and I see many efforts by members of this board trying to find a resolve to problems out here. I think our obligation and our challenge is see, see what we got, what's presented here, to have hardship or don't. I'm going to make a motion that we did not, based on four hardships here, I mean four, very, you had a lack of four, what, what am I trying to say? Lack of four hardships. Right. Yeah, lack, lack of four hardships, so I'm going to vote up. Okay, make motion's motion been made. Is, is there a second to the motion? I will second. Second. Okay, motion's been made and properly seconded. Any more discussion? Seeing none, and let's have a hand vote for this. All those in favor of denying the uh, four uh, variances, signify by saying aye and raising your hand. Aye. aye. Opposed? It, um, that motion passes five to two. So it's denied to allow those four variances. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, if the board is prepared to proceed, we'll go on to case number 2017-017. Yosef Becky is the appellant and owner of the property located at 520 Harding Place. This is a short-term rental case, um, basically a classic item A appeal. Uh, the operator operated a short-term rental property, but without first requiring the legally required permit, uh, your packet kind of gives some evidence as to the reviews that were determined upon uh, the operator's eventual application in December of 2016. This is his appeal to the board. Um, Mr. Becky, if you'll introduce yourself by name and address, you'll have 10 minutes to make the desired presentation. I should ask first, is there anyone here in opposition to this case? 
Seeing none, again, that'll be 10 minutes to make your desired presentation. Hello, thank you. Uh, Yosef Becky, uh, 520 Harding Place. Um, I recently bought this pro property, um, first time homeowner, um, native of Nashville, and I'm you know, excited uh, to have a house, but also um, I'm sure y'all would understand that um, the housing market has gotten you know, um, hot here, and um, a little extra income um, through a short-term rental property uh, will be helpful for me um, in the coming years, the coming 30 years, uh, you know, with my loan. Um, so, um, I wanted to uh, start with Airbnb, and I may have started too early once I decided or once I realized that I needed a permit, I came in to get that permit and um, was rejected. So I'm so let's just walk here to the rectify. Process. Okay, yes. so you advertise this on Airbnb. Yeah. So how'd you hear about Airbnb? Oh, just through friends through media. Um, and how did you hear about Metro's regulation of Airbnb? Um, once I started, my parents said, wait, actually I heard something about that on the news. You do your parents live here in Nashville? <laughs> yes. Okay, so when you found out about that, what did you do next? I went through the process of getting a permit. And so when you came down to get your permit, how did that process go? Um, well, uh, the first time I, well, once I was able, actually able to see someone, because I had to go through this okay, a yeah. few times, you know how. So you have your little packet in your yeah, hand. Yeah, I have my little so packet. walk us through that day. Yeah, um, have my packet in my hand. Uh, my mm -hmm talking to one of, I guess, your uh, or someone in the mm -hmm. Coast Department. Um, and he asks um, about insurance. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh, yeah, well, um, I'm going to be doing this through Airbnb. So I, um, he goes and checks out um, the website and sees that I still have where I have the Oh, so um, he, while ad. you were there, he looks at Airbnb and, and he puts the address and says, aha, yeah. you've been doing this before. And what did you say? I said, yes, and I'm here just because I need to correct this. I need to go ahead and. And he said? Um, well, this is the rule of the law, all right? <laughs> or, you know, this, these are codes. This is, so I, how can't, many, I can't reject. How, how many listings you. did you have and did you cancel any of them? I did cancel them. Um, when? I, I guess before you was, went to Metro. No, 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 not before. Okay, so after you, the guy said, eh, you, you don't have a permit, so you canceled all of them." Right, and okay. I'm going through this process to, you know, okay. get an approval, and then, you know, therefore continue. We've, we've we've heard this song before. I'm sure. I'm sure. So, uh, questions, board members. Okay. Anything else to add? Um, How long, let's ask you, when did you actually apply and when were you denied? Um, I do not have that in front of me at the moment. Um, but was, what month was it? I guess that was in November. So since November, you've pulled down all your listings and you haven't had any? Right. Okay. Um, Mr. Think, Chairman, application date December the 12th of 16, rejection date about 10 minutes later. Yeah, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anything else to add? No, I want, sir. I want to ask, is this mm -hmm. going to be, are you proposing an owner-occupied or non-owner? Owner-occupied. Okay, thank okay. you. Okay. Hopefully this will be my forever home. We'll see. Yes. Okay. Anything else to add? No. Okay. We're going to close the public hearing. Okay. The council has empowered us now to give less than a year. Is this one of these cases? Yeah. I mean, this is, I mean, I think this is classic owner-occupied. Stopped renting when he found that he wasn't doing the right thing, immediately tried to do the right thing. And so I'm, I'm happy to, you know, make a motion that we find that the zoning administrator did not err in his denial of the permit, but in our ability to uh, offer less than a year uh, a punishment for that, that we uh, allow this applicant to be uh, eligible immediately for uh, a permit. Okay, motion's been made. Is there, is there a second? Okay, motion's made properly second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Congratulations. You are now eligible to have your house for Airbnb. Contact John Michael. Well, and yeah, the you're eligible for a permit. You have to get your permit. Yes, you still have to go get your permit. Yes. You still have to uh, abide by the laws. And so anybody else out there know that their Metro regulates these. So before you list, 
listing is a violation of the law, not renting, listing. So uh, okay. good luck with everything. Thank you, sir. And thank you. Mr. Chairman, the next case to be presented to the board skips well ahead to case 2017-021. This involves the subject property just off of Murfreesboro Road at uh, 308 Felfry Court. The request is for a series of variances at the subject location shown here, a CS zoned property, commercial service, in the floodplain overlay district. Shown here from its aerial view, an undeveloped lot. Proposed site plan. Uh, the setback, the variances requested are for number one, a rear setback variance, number two, a street setback variance, number three, a parking count variance, and finally four, a buffer or more specifically landscape strip variance, all for uh, the CS district for a new auto repair shop. The site visit photographs show the property in its current condition, or at least current as was the case Tuesday of this week. Um, the view on the Upper left and lower left showing the view up and down the street on Feel Free. Lower left, the view back toward Murfreesboro Pike. Um, the upper left hand corner showing to the end of the little roundabout there on the court. And then finally, if you right across the street, there is the lower right hand corner. Is there anyone here in opposition to this case? Seeing none, is there anyone here on behalf of this case? Seeing none, Mr. Chairman, I believe the board's practice, given that this is a first setting for the case, is to contemplate whether to defer one meeting or give somebody a chance to get in here, or in the alternative, given the absence of proof put before you at this hour, you can technically deny it. We will not be as harsh as other judicial bodies, probably. So um, okay. if, if people do not object, let's let him come to the next meeting and please reach out to the applicant and say. May we solicit a motion to that effect, Mr. Chair? Yes. I move that we defer one meeting. Okay, motion's been made. Is there a second? Second. Second. Um, any discussion? Seeing none. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Deferred to the next meeting. So, yeah. <laughs> had a cardiology appointment. The next case to be presented to the board is case 2017-024 for property located at 300 McMillan Street, not too far here in the downtown Nashville area. Destiny Johnson is the appellant, Harold Johnson, the owner of the subject property, and the request is for variances from number one, lot size, and number two, rear setback requirements in the MUIA, or alternative district, with a plan to construct two single family houses on the subject lot. The aerial gives you a view of the Actually mixed area. This aerial doesn't show you there is some residential use on McMillan and in this area. Um, the proposed site plan shown here gives you a feel for the layout of the proposed two units on this lot. The intersection of Hines and McMillan. From my recent site visit, you see uh, the lot just from, well, from the middle of the street. I'm not sure who stood there. That might have been one of the other staff members, Mr. Chairman. Uh, then the view down Hines to the upper left. Uh, down McMillan to the lower left, and the view kind of across the street from um, that intersection in the lower right. Is there anyone here in opposition to this case? Very well, there's at least one. Is there anyone here in support of this case? Very well, if the appellants would please come forward, you have 15 minutes to make the desired presentation. Please feel free to save whatever portion of your time you wish for a rebuttal after the opponents have their opportunity to speak. Specifically with regard to the lot size variance and rear setback variance, please introduce yourself by name and address and make the desired presentation. Excuse me, John, can you just tell me the scope of the lot size variance? Uh, minimum lot size for residential development is 3,750 feet under the zoning code. And although I do not have the exact dimensions because this is, as you can see, not a neatly rectangular lot, uh, it's estimated to be slightly less than 3,000, I think was what staff had indicated in the notes. Okay. Please identify yourself and your address and let's begin. My name is Destiny Johnson and I'm here in regards to 300 McMillan Street. I reside at 2020 Aaron Lane. Okay. Uh, my name is Harold Johnson. I'm the owner of the property. Uh, my address is 914 Villa Place. Okay, so you want a, a variance from the lot size and rear setback. So walk us through this. Yes. Um, well, uh, our, our code states that um, for two families, we need a minimum square foot of 3750 for our lot size. However, uh, there's another code in our and the code is 17.12.020D. That code states that we can have three units. Uh, on the property 
however, if we only do two two units on the property, uh, we, we need 3750. But if we did an extra unit, then then the, there there is no requ requirement for that. And we kind of have a small lot right there, so we're trying to get a good architectural design for for the for the property. Uh, there's a lot of dilapidated structures in the neighborhood that are that are single family and multi family dwellings. We're trying to improve the the, the street and, and make the make the street a little. A little okay, nice. so what's your hardship? I served on the historic zoning commission for about five years and always heard the argument from people. Well, we're tearing down an old shabby house and improving. And uh, we're not tearing down anything, it's a blank We're building something in a yes, blighted sir. neighborhood, or that's what people say, so but the, the, that, the, you need a hardship. What's your hardship? The, the size of the lot, and, and also it's a, it's a corner lot. Uh, another hardship that we have is the power lines on the front, which is restricting our building envelope. We need to be 10 foot off of those power lines according to uh, NES and, and uh, OSHA. So that, that, that encroaches into our building envelope even more. And I, I believe building codes is wanting us to build all the way to the front of that property, right, right up to the street, which is impossible because the power lines would prohibit us from doing that. So that, 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 that would be another hardship that, that we're encountering. And I have a few items that I would like to pass out to you guys mm -hmm. too. Sure, absolutely. A question of our um, our uh, zoning staff. Um, it's a corner lot, so what it says rear setback requirements. Which is the rear? In this case, I think it's going to be if you look at the zoning map you get a sense of the shorter frontage is typically what planning identifies for the face of the building and therefore the opposite of that face. So um, the map shown here, I guess the, if you look at that intersection of the grassy section, the portion to the left is still McMillan, to the right is still Hines. It's the McMillan side, which would make the opposite end backing up to, I believe that's what's been identified and that's the rationale. Uh, as to why they identified that as the rear setback. I would note that because this is in an A district, specifically the MUIA, there's actually a build to zone. The appellant stated correctly that one thing that is allowable is a zero foot setback at the front because that's the nature of the build to zone. But that's a zero to 15 foot window. So you're not actually required to build at zero. That is an option if you meet other criteria. And as he explained, they've got other problems there with power lines, et cetera. But zero to 15 is the build to zone requirement, not just zero. And the, John, do you know the, on Hines Street, it has a 2.8 foot width, it looks like, to the street with a little section in black. Do you know why that, maybe I can, I should have, do you know or should I ask the appellant? Depending on the specific nature of your question, you may want to start with the appellant because I'm not sure what you're looking yeah, for there. Can you explain that, that triangle in black that you have on Pine Street? The triangle in black. Let me pull that up. It's on the screen. Uh, I believe I believe that would be blank land. Uh, we, we had to cut into the garage. Uh, I don't believe that that's part of the envelope. I think he he's kind of dropped that back to, to it here with the side setbacks is what it appears to me. Um, we got this from our architect who, who's drawn this for us, and he's not present today. All right, so I'm I'm, I'm I'm a little confused so by the triangle. I'm, I'm making an educated guess. So you're not you're not asking for a side setback. So if any of that is in the side setback and it gets built, yeah. then it's in. Yes, it's sir. Not correct. Okay. Yes, sir. Do you know if there's ever been a structure on this land? This I'm, lot? I'm I'm not sure. I know this is in the footprint of the old Tennessee State Prison, but I don't necessarily know if there's been houses in this area. I know that there was one next door on 214 McMillan Street. I actually own that property and we've constructed a warehouse there and I'm the owner of Hardwoods in Nashville and we run a flooring company out of that location. So, so your understanding is that if you build three homes on the lot, we're, you can we're build. Good. We're, we're good. We're, we're good on three. However, three we're, we're kind of limited on the, the square footage and the architectural design that we can do on that. And 
we would really like to do two homes. Plus, not only that, but the traffic with three families coming in and out of that location mm -hmm. and, and the lot size parking. Uh, I don't believe that there's street parking in that location, so parking would be an issue for us. And that's kind of why we've got the, the garages constructed right there where they can whip in right there and, and, and be off the street mm -hmm. and in other houses. It's really unusual for people to come in and want to build less than what they're actually allowed on <laughs> yes, um, the right. size of, <laughs> on the lot. So I don't understand. Ms. Carpenter, if I can intervene yes, there, please. it's not clear to me the basis again whereby the less than 3,100 square foot lot is deemed under 1712.020 subsection D, which is the land use table for A districts, where three is allowed on this lot? That, that's what we were told by Richard Thomopoulos at the coach department, that okay. th three were, were allowed. He, he looked up the code for us at the, at the office. I'm sorry, we should have probably. Oh, that's okay. I'll today. keep digging. And so it's on their application, by the way, that was um, provided by the zoning department. That's where I read it. And what size is the property? How many square feet is it? 3,074 uh, square feet. Three zero seven four. Yes, sir. Okay. And John Michael, remind us the buildable lot for two structures for this. For one or two, the minimum lot size in Davidson County is three thousand seven hundred fifty. So they're off about seven hundred. And what's the lot size variance hardship that you all have? You're asking for a variance in lot size too. So what's your hardship? Uh, the variance in lot size would apply because if we built three, we're fine. If we build two, we need to have the 3,750 square feet, but we only have 3,074 square feet. And you can also see by our pictures in, in the later pages in my packet that there is residential use around there, okay. so it wouldn't our, stand out too much. Our hardship rules deal with physical characteristics of the lot, not... So we could have built more. So what's your real? Well, I have a question about that, David. If if the if the property is smaller than you can legally build on, isn't that in and of itself the hardship? I mean, but you could they, they don't have any choice about. They can't. It's not like they can make the lot bigger, can they? Yeah, and, and the power lines encroaching on 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 the the building envelope uh, of the property even diminishes the three thousand square foot that that much more. So that that would okay. be your hardship, sir. It's just, it's just odd, and I don't understand it, and I'm just reading what was given to us by the zoning department that they could build more on the lot. They're allowed to build more, and they're asking to build less. That's just... Well, and Ms. Carpenter, if I could speak to that a little bit, having read through it a little bit more, I see where... I see the section that's being discussed in the land use table at 1712... I'm sorry, not the land use table, but at 1712-020, subsection D is in David. Um, this is the section that deals with our alternative zoning districts, a collection of zoning districts that, as you know, from your development experience, have only existed for, what, five years or less, I suppose, at this point. So that is a much more recently enacted piece of legislation than some of the other traditional bulk regulations and the other uh, setback minimum lot size ISR, FAR type tables have been in place ever since the inception of the uh, current zoning code in January 1 of 98. The minimum lot area for MUIA, this particular zoning district, as well as MUGA, MULA, MUNA, the minimum lot area for all those is none. However, it's worthy of note that the primary contemplated use of property zoned in that matter is not residential. Mixed use, sure, of course, we see that. But when you're talking about zero minimums lot areas, and instead you have to kick back and you say, well, but two would require a minimum of 3750, that's because that zoning designation had existed for many years preceding this zoning designation. So it becomes to some extent a question of legislative interpretation of what was the legislative intent. We don't have a council member here who wrote the legislation. We don't have a planning department who helped draft it to speak to that directly. However, you've hit it on the head. Common sense tells you that three units don't fit on a 3,000 square foot lot. It, just like the appellant said, they've noted the traffic coming in and out, figuring out the turnaround with garages or open parking spaces, the absence of street parking at a downtown intersection like that. There's a lot of reasons that doesn't even make sense. But uh, the board has the opportunity to determine whether or not they think it's appropriate to grant a lot size variance of, in this case, Mr. Chairman may have pointed to it, of around 700 feet, give or take, which exceeds 20%, I think, by my quick math. Um, 
in order to get a second unit on there, or the first for that matter, because even a single family unit would require a lot size variance in this instance. Can I, can I ask our, our, count, our, uh, our counselor a question about that? It, when the lot size is below the minimum to build on, can, can that in and of itself be a hardship? I mean, could, could we find that? I mean, I, I guess we could find anything, but is that something that would stand up to scrutiny? Microphone. And pull it forward. Y'all right. Since me, the lot y'all size, y'all asked me so many questions. I didn't have. My, don't even know how to work my mic. <laughs> <laughs> that, that the lot size is too small for the minimum, and can that in and of itself be a hardship to give relief on the lot size minimum? I mean, I think if the lot size is too small, that's usually enough to be a hardship. Like for certain things, and y'all have said that before, that the size of the lot or shape or irregularity, but I don't really, I don't know if I understand all of the intricacies of this appeal. Well, and I think to Mr. Harper's question, historically the department has looked at it as, it sounds like you're asking the question, if I understand it, uh, it's almost like defining a word with that word in the definition. Can a, can a small lot size be the hardship for a small lot? Uh, while we're asking legal questions, one of the, uh, in the letter of opposition that we have, it says that, uh, I guess at one point this was one lot and it was subdivided at some point, but they make a, que that raise a question about um, it being an illegal subdivision and hasn't been property, properly platted and is that a requirement before they can do something and is there a, Tell me. Two part question there. The question of legal lot, staff on its initial review of the case, of the appeal or application, I suppose, determined that it was a legal lot, legally created in 1961. To the question of platting, um, although it might require that it be platted to clean up whatever questions from the prior subdivision, which is sometimes done by deed in the old days and we have to clean up after the fact. Um, that wouldn't necessarily be anything that would prevent issuance of a variance. It might prevent issuance of the final building permit until that cleanup takes place. After all, the variance would be very specific to the uh, lot size question and the rear setback question. Um, but that's something that could be cleaned up after the fact, I guess, if I'm getting to the intent of your question. Yeah, no, that, that, I mean, I was just, like I said, I'm trying to get all the issues and, and there are a lot of issues that are raised that uh, may or may not be relevant to us. I mean, they, they may be remedies through codes I mean, there are you know some claims that are said, you know, it's it's too high or it's too wide. Well, that, they're not coming asking for those that type of variance. And so, if it is too high or driveway's too wide, then that can be cleared up at codes. Or if they got a building permit, then they could come back and say, hey, it shouldn't have been issued because of these violations. But I, but that was one that that I felt like. I mean, there may be some that are applicable, and they can talk about that in a minute. But I just wanted to make sure when we were asking legal questions if, about the planning, which. Uh, seemed in line with the lot size. So can I just go back a second to what you said before? I want to be sure I understood. The There's a minimum lot size in Davidson County, and we know what that is. And this lot is smaller. However, in the alternative zoning districts, there's no minimum lot size for uses that are approved in the, I guess this is MUIA. So it's not necessarily an unbuildable lot because they could build something else. They just can't build. That statement is correct, that they could build something else. And okay. of course, the land use table gives us an idea of what all is permitted under MUIA. If I may, may make one important clarification, mm -hmm. it's not that there are no minimum lot areas in any of the A districts. All of the residentially zoned districts, whether they be RM, R, I'm not sure that we've been on the RS if that applies the same way or not. But with these R districts, there are minimum lot areas um, as defined under that table for multifamily, mixed use, and non-residential uses. Um, it's MUIA that doesn't define it. Anything else to add right now? You'll, of course, have time to come back for a rebuttal after the opposition speaks. No, sir. Okay. Any other questions before we hear from the opposition? Okay. You'll have 11 minutes and 14 seconds, and let's hear from the opposition. Please come forward and state your name and address for the record.
Good evening. <laughs> uh, I'm Jack Wilder. Uh, I own the adjacent property at 301 15th Avenue North. And we have a nice letter from you in the packet, too. Very lengthy. Yes. And, um, you've received my letter of opposition. I think the, uh, some of the, the data details from my standpoint, the big picture for me personally is I believe that this proposed project would significantly impact the, the present and the future value of my property. Now, there will be some conflict as far as business activity and things. How is this going to impact the value of your property? Uh, the, uh, and if I might show you, uh, you know, if you can, the bigger picture of the neighborhood, I think, is uh, I've got about an acre that is uh, adjacent to this on the north and the east. And this 3,000 square feet uh, adjoin it on both sides, on the north and the east. Um, I and several other I'm property sorry, owners. I'm sorry. I'm, could, is your property in this image that, that we're looking at now? Yes. It's, it's the one with the, the, the fenced in area? Yes, the fenced in area and also the building at the begin at the top of the picture. Okay. So I own the property. It's also half of the lot. Yes. Do uh, you also own the gravel lot that's half of what correct. used to be the old? Right. Okay. So, so how, the, you're saying that this is going to negatively impact your property values? Yes, sir. Yeah, tell us how. Um, from the present and future development uh, value, uh, having a, a 3,000 square foot development that's going to abut this, my property on two sides, I think is going to adversely affect. This is what real estate and developer people are telling me, that they say, you know, this is going to adversely affect your property to have a 3,000 square foot duplex or office building, whatever you want but to call it. But why is that such a negative use compared to what's going on in the area right now? Including what's going on at your property? What, what do you do on that property with the fence and the vehicles? What we're doing mm -hmm. business-wise? Yeah, what, do you, what, what is that? Okay. Well, that is um, we rent and sell construction equipment, and, okay. and we uh, the northern part of that, the eastern part of it is the building and warehouse where we work on equipment and we have retail sales and then the storage lot there is where we store equipment and prep it for, for use. So that's going to affect your rental business if there's a nice little lot here? It's going to affect my, my property value based on what developers and real estate people are telling me. That the, the bigger picture, and if we would go from Charlotte up to Church Street and from I-40 back toward Baptist Hospital, there's a lot of vacant property or big parcels of property. I've got a, I've got a map if, if, yeah. if so Mr. I can Waller, show you. I don't need to tell you, you've been okay. here in Nashville, right. sounds like all your life. Whether this person builds on this lot or not, the real estate value in this neighborhood is just going to go up and keep going up, right? Doesn't have anything I to do. I certainly hope so. But this, this portion right here, is I think going to add for adversely affect. Oh, you say the if they value. build it there, that's going to decrease the value of your yes. loan. Yes. Yes. How? I think it's going to be inconsistent with um, <clears throat> the future development of my property and also other properties that are very close by. Um, there's like two acres right. Uh, uh, well, it's in the uh, in the bottom part of this picture here. You see those two houses, those houses are gone. There's about two acres that is up for sale now, uh, right across State Street from there is the Gupton uh, College property. There's two acres there that has been up for sale. I've got one acre right up the street on on the so why are you objecting to these variances of building on lot size and rear setback? How does that affect your property? Yes. Or use? May, may I give a hand? Mm -hmm. I'm Courtney Hollins with Dickinson Wright. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm a lawyer assisting Mr. Wilder. Um, if you look at some of the broader pictures and, and include it in our package, 
um, is a broader picture of the area. Um, the area 100 years ago or so probably was primarily residential. Uh, it was, over the it course, was a state prison. Oh, okay. Yes. Oh, that's residential. People live there. Before we built the state prison that everyone calls the castle, that <laughs> McMillan <laughs> Street is named after Governor Benton McMillan, who was governor in the 19th century. You, you know more about the history than I. But if, if you look at some of the broader pictures, um, the whole area is predominantly commercial. There is very little residential through the area. Um, Mr. Wilder's business is um, basically he moves water on construction sites. He's got a large, large number of large trucks, trailers, equipment, that kind of thing, that he moves in and out of there on a regular basis. Um, his trucks and trailers are regularly utilizing all these roads, McMillan and, I forget the name of the side street, um, along with the alley, um, back and forth. To put a residential property there, which is very unique to that immediate area, um, would put a burden on his ability to move equipment in and out of his business, um, simply having residential people, children, that kind of thing. When you look at the plans, um, not only do you have that 2.8-foot two, space, um, you know, bringing it within 2.8 feet of the road, and I, I believe, according to the drawing, as I look at it, that black area is the area on which the garage portion will encroach onto the 5-foot area that is supposed to be a setback. So the actual setback would be the 2.8 feet, and if you look further again, at the porch, which is right there at the corner of McMillan and Haynes, um, extrapolating a little bit, but that corner of the porch is probably what? A foot, foot and a half from the street. Um, you're talking about moving people in and out on a residential basis in a, in a neighborhood that is distinctly commercial. Um, Mr. Wilder's business is distinctly commercial with a lot of large um, equipment and trucks and trailers in and out of there. Um, that's the basis for the inconsistency of the use. Can I ask I you a question? Um, yeah. So are you simply opposed to residential use on this site? I mean... Well, it's maybe it's the lateness of the hour, but I keep, as, as I'm mm -hmm. sitting there, I keep envisioning um, trying to squeeze an elephant into a closet. Um, it'd be nice to get the elephant into the closet, but if the elephant just doesn't fit, it, it really doesn't belong. Does your client think, or Mr. Wilder, do you think that the property should never be developed? It should remain a green lot? No. Um, I think the, the it is so small in, this, in the scope of the neighborhood between Charlotte and Church Street and I-40 and, let's say, 17. You know, if, if, if you could pan out and look at all that, you think, well, we're going to have a 3,000 square foot development in the midst of all these acres that are eventually going to be developed mm -hmm. into commercial, multi-use, whatever. I thought it's, you know, it's not a, I'm not a city planner, but it just seems like it's a very bad plan. And, and I, under, I understand, I understand that. And, but I guess the, what I'm looking at if what they're requesting you know, they're not asking for a variance on Hind Street. They're asking for a back, a rear setback. And so they will have to build Hind Street to codes. And, and we ask, is it, what, what is that black triangle? And it's curious, but not relevant <laughs> because it's, it's not, they're not asking for a variance there. So whatever it is has to be to codes. And the fact that they can build they're not asking for a special exception to build residential, so the fact that they chose to build a home here rather than anything else is kind of their prerogative. I mean, and it's not, I mean, I, I understand the opinion and I'm not saying I even disagree with it, but I don't even see how I can consider whether or not a home is appropriate. Now, and, and so I guess to me, the only thing that, if, if, it, if it were a single family, I would absolutely be saying, you know, they have a right to build a home. Uh, as a, as a uh, 
Duplex, I understand your issue on the lot size, yeah, but, but, I, but let, let me clarify. Um, uh, residential is permitted is a permitted use, so the objection isn't to residential per se. The request is for two variances, one based on size lot, the other based on the rear setback, mm -hmm. so that they can build a duplex. That's simply too much for that lot. Given the size of a lot, given the area, given the neighborhood, given the fact that you're at intersecting streets, given the fact that you've got major commercial, including massive trucks and, and that kind of thing going back and forth. So, so understanding what the zoning is, um, the prospect for being able to put a duplex there as it's currently designed does adversely impact the area. It does adversely impact Mr. Walter's property and his ability to do, do his business, which has been there for 45 years. So that's just just make sure we're on the same page. So that that's the point. Right, and I, I understand. It felt like it was getting you know a little. I mean, I, I, I get that. It's very different than the argument of it would be nice if this were all this block were all one parcel, which is what I've also heard. And so, but tell me, uh, specifically tell me your thoughts on the rear setback, which is the five foot request that would be between the car and the gravel lot and how that, and John, what, was, what is the setback there? It's 20? It's 20 the rear, because this is all out of the base zoning code table for single and two family. MUIA carries that 3750 lot area, 20 rear setback, three on the side setbacks, and the maximum building coverage of 0.6. Yeah. And, and I would think there would be some good discussion on on the duplex aspect of it, um, but you've also heard, if you have suffered through the whole meeting, <laughs> to know that uh, there has been the comment made uh, on uh, not allowing for some of those setbacks to make a lot un completely unbuildable. You know, you can't, I mean, if mm -hmm. that, um, whether it's appropriate for duplex or not, I, I, I'm not, you know. Yeah. So what what setback uh, is appropriate for the rear if, if 20 would make it unbuildable? Um, well, I don't think 20 would, would make it unbuildable. Um, we, we were that's fair enough too. Yeah, and I mean, we were doing some rough calculations based on drawings, but the alley, make sure I'm right on this, um, the alley parallels McMillan Street. You just lost me. Okay. Yes. Wait a minute. Yeah, the alley par parallels McMillan Street. Mr. Walder's property is immediately to the, I guess that's the north, to the north and left. east. Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, when you're looking at the lot dimension specifically, according to the Johnson's architect, you've got a lot dimension of roughly 40 feet on the front, 56 feet on the back, and your distances going along the sides are roughly 61 and, I don't see the other dimension, about 62 feet. So if you've got a 20 foot rear setback, you still have a building pad of roughly 40 by 40. Okay. That, that's, that, that's what I want to do. Yeah, and, and, and that's, that's also important in terms of the use of his property back there. Okay. Uh, I've also, and, and I believe that y'all have received um, a letter from uh, the, um, Midtown North Alliance Neighborhood Association. Yes, we have. Okay, uh, from Mr. McDonald. Mr. McDonald. Mm -hmm. uh, he is also he's he had to leave a mm -hmm. couple of hours ago. Um, he's also representing Jack Cawthon, who owns property. Who Jack's Barbecue. He owns quite a bit of property just north of me. Mm -hmm. So he is he is my neighbor and also owns property on McMillan, and so he has expressed his opposition on behalf of the Neighborhood Association and also on, on behalf of Jack Cawthon. Any questions for the applicant? I mean, I'm sorry, the <laughs> long meeting. Uh, long yes. Can't believe I'll do what you did. Um, so, 
for free. The, the, your two, so you just don't think that what they're asking for makes sense given the location of the neighborhood and I'm just trying to figure out Go with why, it. if they're allowed to build this yeah, the way that they propose. I would object to the variance on the rear. Yeah. And also does, the general, the big picture I think is the incompatibility with the whole neighborhood. So but by putting a residential in this area, you're saying it's going to have an adverse impact on yes, your property? on my property value. But your, 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 your case for the rear setback is that limiting what you can do if a building is five foot from your property and it should be 20. Yes. Because mm -hmm. let's just say the, the, the fast forward, maybe not very many months or years, that here comes quite a few developers and they, and they say, well, wait a minute, you've got this Some problem that's five feet away from my proposed property line. That's a, a duplex that's this little thing, and so that's going to diminish the value of what I can okay. sell the property for. Sure. Although it is, it, is a lot, it is a lot that would be right for wanting a rear setback itself because it is a very small lot itself. So, yeah. uh, I, you know, the, the likelihood of, of both of those properties needing a rear setback is, yeah. is very high. But this is what real estate uh, people and developers are telling me and have told me for several years is that this, this would be a problem if a proposal like this mm -hmm. is allowed. Okay, can and it would be very inconsistent with yeah. the neighborhood. Can I get another clarification? From, yes. I thought in MUIA you did not have any required rear or side setbacks. For, if it's not for uh, single and two mm -hmm. family use is where we get those setback requirements. Right. If, however, the development was not, and I just looked at the same question, so I'm almost glad you asked because you justified my homework, for multifamily, mixed use, or non-residential alternative zoning districts like MUIA, the listed rear setback requirement, none required. So you can max out the lot if you didn't do single or two family. Perhaps if you wanted to put a, a commercial business, a retail business, um, if you could somehow fit three family, there is no setback required. Multifamily? So Multifamily is three family. I mean, multi-family would include That's correct. Under the zoning code, three-family is multi-family, mm -hmm. which is yep. where you trigger this portion of the zoning code. So the zero setback would be noticeably different than the five proposed in this variance request and different, obviously, than the 20 required under the base zoning code for single or two-family. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you. We're going to hear from the applicant again. So, so just, just, John, so I'm, I'm clear on what you just said. If the applicant were to come back to us and say, I want two duplex office suites, exact, pretty much like it is, they would only be asking for a lot size variance. They would not be asking for a rear setback. If I understand your question to be two office suites, right. no residential use at all, they wouldn't come back to you. They would walk out with a building permit because there is no minimum lot area required under MUIA for non-residential um, alternative zoning districts, multifamily mixed use, uh, if it was not in fact mixed but just right straight office, and there's also no rear setback required under MUI zoning in that scenario. So then, then the question back to the applicant is why is it important, uh, if, if there are many options that you can develop on this property, why is it important for you to put a duplex and ask a residential duplex there, rather than another uh, use. There's multiple condo projects in the neighborhood on Hind Street. Um, the property right across from us, um, we, we've heard through real estate investors and uh, other uh, brokers in the neighborhood that that is going to be developed out and it's going to be a large apartment complex or condo unit. Uh, it's several acres. Uh, I, I don't know why they haven't pursued that yet, but we've caught wind that, that something is fixing to go on in the neighborhood for residential. Not only that, but the views that we have of downtown from that, uh, it, it's, it's priceless. Um, in regards to, 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 to them, 
their opposition about the, the, the variance on the rear setback. You know, I think we would be doing them a favor by, by staying five foot, because if we did do a, a we're gonna build something on there, whether it's residential or if we have to go commercial with it, we can. Uh, I would much rather do residential. We have so many people moving to the Nashville area. It's prime location, it's downtown. Uh, eventually, I don't see that going, uh, I don't see that going commercial, I, I kind of see it going residential with everything that else is, that's going on in the neighborhood right across from Nashville Electric Service. I know you all see the, the big development that's going on out there. Everything's condominiums going on in that area. The downtown area is really calling for residential condominiums and, and that's, what we, that's what we would like to do is, is a re residential condominium to, to, to bring in outside people and make the street better. And, improve Nashville and okay anything else to add no sir well, she does yes. <clears throat> also I would like you to look at the second page of this packet that I have here mm -hmm. I would like to add according to our survey there is a 0 0.3 foot encroachment on our property due to the fence, and we're not too worried about it. <laughs> well, that's a whole different and issue. And then I would also like yeah. to add, per my conversation yesterday with Mr. Wilder, he had mentioned that his father, who had passed, wanted to buy that property that we own, and we never negotiated it. Just to throw that in there. Okay. Um, any other questions of the applicant? And I would like to add one more thing. Mm -hmm. You can see the pictures that I've taken from the street today. Mm -hmm. There is residential houses there. Yes. Very familiar with this neighborhood. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Going to close the public hearing. Discussion. So this is in this area, this emerging area, which, as I mentioned one time, was the home of the Tennessee State Prison. But now, given its proximity to the Gulch and Capitol View and all this other stuff, um, you're going to see some development like this. So this is, so recently, the BZA was granted an ability to give lot size variances. And so it seems like every meeting we have one of these. So as John Michael pointed out that the, um, requirement for a minimum buildable lot is 3,700 3, feet or so. And this is around 3,000, a little over 3,000 feet. So a variance of 700 foot. So they're asking for two variances, one from the minimum lot size and one from the rear setback. We have the neighboring property owner saying it's, he's against that. There's a, there's a strangeness to the rule, and I'm not gonna argue one way or the other about whether it's, the, the strangeness is that if it were multifamily, they could, I think, in this neighborhood, they could build right on the on the line. And if yeah. it were commercial, they wouldn't need to And if it's commercial, here. they could build right on the line, but because they want to build a uh, one or two family home, they're bound, you know, they're bound by the, you know, appropriate rules. But it, it does, there is something that seems really strange about that, uh, or intentional, you know, I mean, I, don't, I can't speak for the, I mean, it may mean that they want, the council is encouraging in these areas to be more dense, and so they want it to be, uh, commercial going to the uh, to the property lines, or more than a single or multifamily. Um, I, I do think, in a re if if someone wants to build a home on this lot, they have a right to build a home on that lot. Uh, whether they have a hardship, I, I, I'm, I'm struggling with. Um, you know, the, the opposition made a point that it is a buildable lot without it, 40 by 40. I think they can do. It. That seems like a buildable uh, space. So I. I'm a little bit, uh, I appreciate that, and I do believe that the area is going residential uh, with some of the things that have been announced and that are in the works uh, in the neighborhood. Uh, but I also am a little hesitant with the choice of this when you've got a lot of other options that don't require coming here too. I have a question just because I don't, it's not my area. If we grant, if we granted the uh, lot size variance, but not the 
setback is it is it you're saying that's a buildable lot size so if we made them build at 20 mm -hmm. from the rear but told them they could build on this smaller lot that that is buildable it seems like a small house could fit okay the, you know, the opposition said and but it the front east they said the the electric poles on the front you know was one of their issues and then if you restrict the rear, we might give them the lot size variance, but still it might just be a wash. I'm not sure. Right. I, think, I think both the variances have legitimate hardships. Uh, it, I mean, it is an odd shaped lot and the utilities on the front, you know, certainly uh, can't, can't be dealt with. And, uh, you know, it's it's a small lot. I mean, that's if if you're going to do residential, which is allowed. You know, I. I know, but in looking at all of our, it's still a lot. No. I mean, if we're always asking ourselves what is the hardship, they can develop the lot. They can develop it commercially or residentially, just not in exactly the manner they want to. We didn't talk about this, but obviously they could do more with this lot if there weren't two two-car garages on there, too. True. Yes. Uh, I was going to say I agree with you on the oddness of, or whatever you said before. It, it's very odd. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, there, you know, there are height restrictions and that kind of thing, and then people try to you know, if you go up to so many, if you multifamily and you add another story, then you got, I mean, I'm not an architect but it seems, or an engineer, but it seems like then you get steel and, and other costs that make it a little prohibitive, so everybody's trying to, to squeeze it into what they can do. But, mm -hmm. but I think that part of, part of rationalizing this is, is, or understanding it is, is to think, especially on a lot size variance, does this limit or does this keep this person from using their property? Mm -hmm. And and I, I don't think it does, which, uh, and yet, so, the, you know, the design is nice, everything mm -hmm. they, they say right. about it, right. it, it would be a lovely addition to the neighborhood, I think. So does anyone want to propose a motion? No. We can continue to discuss it. You're sort of familiar with this area, aren't you? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't have an issue with the lot. I mean, the lot size, I'm, I'm perfect. Lot size variance, I'm totally comfortable with because I think that um, that there is a buildable space. It, it is, it's the rear setback. Um, I do think that it would be, you know, the opposition did raise, and I don't know that it's it's totally relevant. But if it, if anyone's thinking about the future development. I can't imagine that little gravel lot having any future development that does not come with, uh, I don't think it'll even have a setback because I think it'll be multi whatever and it'll go to that, you know, go to that property line uh, because that probably is gonna be the highest and best use for that land. So uh, I have no doubt that at some point in the future, uh, there'll be something on that property line and is that fair to this applicant, but it really is based on that applicant's choice of use, which has a whole different set of codes than multifamily or commercial. So I guess I'm, I really am struggling with what is the, the specific, I mean, I, I, I don't know, I'm 50-50 on the, on so the are, setback. So are you saying allowing the, the reduced setback on the rear property line is detrimental to the, to the neighboring property? I, I don't, I know, I don't, I don't, I don't believe it's detrimental. I'm not sure what the hardship oh, is. Okay. And, 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 uh, and that, I know that the neighbor believes it to be detrimental, but I don't. Uh, I, I don't think it's any more detrimental than what potentially could happen, which is the case that the, 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 the you know the neighbor was making. Sure. Anyone want to attempt a motion? Well, I mean, like I said, I, I really am still 50-50 on the, the the rear setback hardship. I, I don't, uh, I, I, I could buy an argument if someone wanted to make it strongly one way or the other, but I'm not there on a motion, but I'm, I'm perfectly so, comfortable with the motion on the lot size. Well, 
my my opinion of, of the rear setback is that it's it's part and parcel to the the small lot it's argument. Right you know, if, if the if if you're willing to grant the small lot, then I mean, we that's one of the reasons we we grant rear setbacks is because it, the lot is too small or too shallow. I agree with that. So I think if you agree to one, then I think it. I think it pulls the other one with it. Yeah, I think if you just grant the lot size and then not the rear setback, they basically, it's a total wash. They probably just end up building what they could build today without any variances. You know, it's probably a little, a net gain, but it doesn't seem like if they have a, have a 20 foot yeah. rear setback, you know, the lot size variance, they kind of lose out. Well, I'll make a motion and if no one seconds or votes it down, that's fine. But I. I say that we approve both variances and, uh, and we find that the hardship is the small uh, property size and the, uh, and the shape of the lot. Okay, motion's been made. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Did, did you vote? Okay, so it passes five to two. Very good, John Michael. Mr. Chairman, you have one case remaining. That's case number 2017-026. Is that right, Dwayne? 026, Build Nashville LLC is the appellant on behalf of Greenlight Real Estate Development LLC, the owner of the property. This is located at 410 36th Avenue North. The property is owned RM20A, just above Charlotte, if you're familiar with Climb Nashville, a property that was before this board about two or three years ago when they were getting off the ground, figuratively and literally. If you can hold on one second, please. Yes, sir. Um, this property has uh, brought a case where they're requesting a variance from height restrictions in that zoning district, Mr. Chairman, in an effort to construct eight single-family townhomes. The site plan shown here, and forgive me if this is a duplicate copy on my part, gives you a sense of the proposed layout of the subject property. I believe your packet has more information than this with regard to the various elevations as well as uh, site layout. The recent site visit shows the property in its current condition. This is looking inbound toward downtown. The view in the lower right-hand corner is directly across the street from the subject property. And then the view up and down, uh, literally up and literally down the street on 36 there in the left and right-hand, um, uh, the left, upper, and lower corners. Um, seeing that there's no one left to contend with this, I'll only take it there's no opposition present, so the appellants will have 10 minutes to make the desired presentation. The request for the height variance is one that they can specify and itemize more capably than I. However, you do have in your packet the breakdown of the four individual components of the height variance request at the four individual points where it is requested. So with that, gentlemen, if okay. you want to introduce yourselves by name and address and make the presentation. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, my name is Dwayne Cuthbertson. I'm at 1010 Ackland Avenue in Nashville. I'm uh, representing the owners in this case. Uh, with me is uh, Sean Burroughs. He is a member of the ownership as well as the builder of uh, this project, or the intended builder, as well as Matt Schlicker. Uh, he's our civil engineer with Kimley Horn. Uh, they're here to answer technical questions if you should have any. Uh, related to this project and uh, our challenges. So as Mr. Michael suggested or um, announced, we are here asking for a variance of the height requirement uh, for our proposed buildings in this RM20A district. Uh, the variance will allow us to build eight attractive infill homes, uh, homes that we feel are consistent with the context of this um, rapidly developing neighborhood, as Mr. Michael showed you in those images. The neighborhood north of Charlotte in this little pocket is um, redeveloping very fast. Most of them uh, with two family homes per lot, three story, between two and three stories. Um, we, our site is located in somewhat of a transitional period between, or position between that R6 neighborhood and the CS zone lots to the south. Um, the zoning, in this case, RM20A, uh, this is a 0.43 acre site. The zoning allows us to build nine, and uh, we're only asking to build eight. Nine would be shoehorning things in. And it just would cramp it up too much. So we're, we're really just asking for, for uh, the variance to allow eight townhomes. Um, if this property were flat, uh, I don't think we'd be in front of this board. I think uh, we'd be able to solve our own problems or our own challenges. Um, but as Mr. Michael alluded, this site um, is on a very, very steep slope. In fact, it drops 
22 feet from its northern corner, the northwest corner to the southeast corner. Um, and it's not, a, it's not a simple drop. It's not a straight drop down the frontage. It drops across the property, uh, and that poses its own challenges. Um, again, we feel like what we're proposing complements the, uh, the developing neighborhood, and it'll make an attractive uh, transition. The relief uh, is kind of in two tiers. So the, the first bit of relief to the height uh, requirement is for that portion of the building that's in the build-to zone. Uh, there's a zero to 15 foot build to zone and we've got about three and a half feet of building inside that build to zone. The, the RM28 district limits us to 30 feet total and it doesn't allow for any extensions. Our six districts allow you to put a parapet above the max height. In this case, it is to the, the top point on the building and that includes the parapet. Um, as you see in the elevations that were handed to you, we are proposing three stories. Um, our, on the northern side, our maximum height for that portion in the build two zone is at about 37 feet. Um, the southern part of the building, again, mostly related or entirely related to topography, it's at 39 feet. Uh, the site drops uh, from that south building wall. Um, so that's the first part of our relief uh, requested. It's for that part uh, in the build to zone. And you know, we thought, well, maybe we could push these buildings back so that they just kiss the build to zone um, and we'd have then we'd be out of that, basically out of that build to zone and we can go up to 45 feet. But because of this site's topography, it, we can't really push the buildings back any further than they are. Um, we've, got to, we've got to play a little bit of a balancing act in where we set our driveway in the center of the site um, so that we can get reasonable approaches to the houses at the back and reasonable approaches to the front houses. We're already at a fairly decent angle between the driveway and the garages at the back of those front houses. If we push those buildings back any further, we exacerbate that slope between the driveway and the garages and pretty much any car that attempts to get in that, that garage is going to scrape bottom. So just so I understand, uh, how much relief are you asking for? I know on one of these drawings it looks like about five inches. Am I looking at that correctly? Or? Um, for the part that's in the build to zone, it the max is 30. Oh, and okay, I'm sorry. So it's, it, it comes off a little more significant. Right, okay. I um, you, yeah. Okay. So that, that's the first bit um, of relief. It's for that part in the build to zone. The second part is related to the overall height. And our overall height in the RM20A district is capped at 45 feet. Um, again, that's measured from the, the grade to the, to the top part of the building. Uh, in this case, it's measured to the top of a stair shelter. Um, it's not to permit a fourth floor. It's, it's only, this variance would allow us to get a reasonable shelter over a stair that gives uh, the owners access to a roof deck. Um, with with this, this bit of relief, it's, Every, it seems like every corner of every single building is different. Uh, for the front buildings on the north side, we comply with the overall height. As the site goes down, once we get to the bottom of those front buildings, we are just over that maximum height. Um, the back buildings, the, the topography gets more extreme. And so in those rear buildings, that topography on the back corners of those buildings uh, it, it drops significantly, and we find our dimensions um, at the at the at the extreme at 52 and a half feet. Uh, but most of that, again, is um, the, the difference between the the grade drop. Um, so um, again, I, I think I mentioned the overall height variance is only to permit a stair shelter. It's not for a fourth floor in this case. Um, we, we feel like these variances will allow us to build a, a very attractive uh, development, one again that fits within the context, particularly tra the transition between the CS district to the south and the R6 district to the south. And um, I really want to point out that in the R6 district, you're limited to, if you're attached, you're limited to three stories and 45 feet. That's measured to the top of the building. Once you get to that 45 feet, you then have the ability to raise a parapet above that by four feet. 
and you can sit on top of a raised basement up to seven feet. So in the R6 district, if you use all these little nuances, you can actually put a building up to 55 feet above the grade. We're capped at a hard 30 in the build two zone and a hard 45 overall on the site. To the south of us is the CS district. Um, it's 30 feet at the street setback, and then there's a, a height height slope um, measurement for, for um, the overall height. With that particular site to the south of us, if they use that, that height slope, we could see a building there at 60 feet because of the depth of the lot. Um, so from a regulatory perspective, I th feel like we what we're proposing fits within that context um, as well. We um, don't feel like this, what we're asking for would be injurious to the neighbors or the surrounding area. Uh, we have talked to uh, most of our neighbors. We've gotten letters from a bud an abutting neighbor. I've got an email today uh, from the neighbor immediately to the north, uh, and he expressed um, support for it in a short statement. Um, I've talked to at least, oh, that email made it, okay, great. Um, yeah, I, John Michael, we don't have any letters of opposition, do we? Not to my knowledge. The only concern originally was, of course, posed by the council member, I think, who may have with, no, 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 I'm sorry, I'm thinking of a different case. I've not seen any letters of opposition. No. That was on, oh, so, oh, yeah, nine, we got sorry. two letters of support, none of opposition. Okay. Yeah. Um, when yeah. your uh, drawings were photocopied, it they made them a bit illegible. So could you tell us the yeah. floor to floor heights of each floor? So the floor to floor heights, uh, for the first floor we're looking at nine feet seven inches, 10 feet one inch for the second floor, and nine feet one inch for the third floor. And, and this then includes in, the structure? I was gonna say in between each floor you have about a foot, uh, one foot four inches. That for structure? For, full, for the full, yeah, floor plate, yeah. Any other questions? Any other questions? Do you have anything else to add? No, sir. Okay. No? Let's close the, um, do you all have anything else to add? No. Let's close the public hearing. Okay. A height variance based on this top floor covered stairwell thing. No, um, two layers of support, none of opposition. John Michael, can you put up aerial up again? So this is an area of, and show me actually the neighborhood properties with the similar structure, yes. So this is what's going on off of Charlotte. And as you can see, the lower right-hand corner, that's what used to be the little house, and now that's what's being built, so. And to be clear, Mr. Chairman, the photo doesn't show it in the bottom left hand all that well, but once you summit that hill, there's more of the same coming down, as you come back down the hill. Yep. This is a neighborhood that is um, very active and actively voices opposition if they don't like something. So uh, I'm not saying that the lack of opposition is absolutely a sign of support, but it is notable that there is no opposition because it is a group that pays attention and uh, or if they didn't like the design or the height or the whatever. Well, I, th I think if there were, yeah, I think if there were, if there were, if it was truly felt that there was going to be harm to the neighborhood, that would be expressed through the community and, and the, the lack of, of that expression, I think, is a positive thing for this uh, proposal. Okay. Last motion of the day. Who wants to make it? Hardship of the topography of this particular lot. Okay, motion's been made. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay, motion's been made properly seconded. Any more discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Passes unanimously. Good luck with your Thank new you. project. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thanks for your patience. And we Mr. Chairman, are with your permission, we'll start our annual two hours of continuing education for the board members. Is this an, is this an appropriate time to. Right not, now. You, you don't, you don't want to. Oh, yeah. Do,
Duly noted. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov. compliance with